Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 367. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co host, Jim, the sensei of the Whatnot Segulin, a truly reluctant leader, and confused by Batman on Arrow. So says the sensei of the Whatnot Segulin and the Duke of You Know. How's it going, eh? <laughs> I didn't know which one you were going to pull into it. I, mm. I knew one of those two were coming reluctant leader or confused uh, co host. I didn't know where you were going to go with this. You pulled in both. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know which one I was going to pull in either. On this episode, we talk about Arrow, the season premiere. We talk about some of the DC games that have been recently released. Um, we shout out uh, the DC Comics panels at the New York Comic Con. We also talk about Earth 2 number 16, Superman Wonder Woman number 1. We have listener voicemails that lead to some very interesting conversations. And it's a fun, action-packed episode, so thanks for joining us. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network and the League of Comic Book Podcasts. Our sponsors for this episode are DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Over at DCBService.com, they have the Villains Month 3D Motion Complete Set. This is a $199.99 set. 50% off, only $99.99. So it is all of the Villains Month issues, all 52 Villains Month titles, including the Forever Evil Number 1 3D Motion Variant Cover Edition. That is quite the collection, so if you missed these in 3D and you've wanted them, this is your chance to get that from dcbservice.com. Remember, they're a digital partner, so if you shop through Comixology, the uh, Diamond Digital, Iverse Media, or My Digital Comics, you get 5% of those orders towards your DCB service orders. And you don't have to spend any more money to do that just by linking those accounts to dcbservice.com. You're supporting our sponsor, but also getting something back for doing it. And you're not spending any more money, which is really cool. Over at instocktrades.com, they are constantly offering amazing sales. They've got a 50% off DC Archive editions. They've got a 45% off sale on many of DC Comics trades. They have 50% off right now the Batman City of Owls trade. This is volume two. This is 50% off, only $849. I mean, what an amazing deal if you're collecting these. Greg Rooka has this new series called Lazarus. 50% off, only $499. I mean, shopping there is amazing because the deals that you get from InStockTrades.com are just stellar. They have the Fantastic Four Omnibus hardcover, volume one. It's a brand new printing of this. 45% off, only $54.99. That's an omnibus. I mean, the deals are amazing over at InStockTrades.com. For those of you that are, are comic fans that are on a budget and you're trying to read more material, if you aren't shopping at DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com, you need to start. Books arrive pristine. They take wonderful care of their customers. Um, we've been shopping with them for years, and we're proud to have them as a show sponsor. James, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on the show. So, if you ever read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Raging Bullets podcast. You like comics, you like free, you like us. Jim, when we kick off this episode, we're going to kind of do this a little different than usual in the sense that we're going to talk about, you know, some of the DC and multimedia and then the New York Comic Con panel reports, just our, our reactions to some of the news and tidbits that we heard. I always get excited when I hear new news about comics, but I wanted to shout out a couple of games I've been playing. I got that DC Squibblenauts Unlimited game or Squibblenauts Unmasked game, and it's pretty cool. The, the premise of it is it's definitely like a family oriented game. Uh, in the sense that you play this character who's got a notebook. And using his notebook, he's able to create objects to solve puzzles in the game. Well, he's a comic book fan and gets dropped into the DC Universe. So he encounters Batman and his arch nemesis, his alter ego, who has a similar power set of being able to use this magic notebook to create just about anything you can imagine, is helping the villains. So... Your job is 
you know, through using your unique notebook that can magically make things appear to help out the heroes to kind of keep Gotham City, Metropolis. And as the game goes on, you keep unlocking different areas like, you know, the Flashes area and, you know, each each of the hometowns of our favorite superheroes. So it's neat. It's a fun game. It's definitely something that it's unique and it's it's not I don't I'm not playing anything else like it right now. I like it because I love your high action games like, you know, the Batman Arkham Origins game that's going to be coming out. You know, to me, I'm, I'm excited for that to be this high action game. They announced that they're or I don't know if they've officially announced it yet, but they do in like this game of the year version of that Injustice. And one of the versions that's going to be coming out is supposed to be the PC version of that. I haven't picked it up yet, so I'm going to pick up the PC version of it. So, you know, I've got my fighter coming out. It's nice to have this fun kind of lighthearted puzzler. And it's just a unique game because you get points for the more creative you are in using unique puzzle solutions. Like if you use ladder for the previous puzzle, if you use ladder again, you lose points. You don't get as much for it because you're not being creative. If you use ladder and then giant staircase, you get more points because you're coming up with unique solutions to the same sort of problem, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you use tank as a weapon and you use tank again, you lose points. If you use tank and then you use jet fighter, you would get more points. I like it because you're kind of forced to get creative with, as the game goes on, with your choice of nouns and verbs and, or nouns and adjectives, really. Nouns and adjectives that you use to create objects to inhabit this world. And there is a benefit to using adjectives. Like if you kick a ladder off at first and it's too tiny, you need to put the adjective huge in front of it. But if you use the same adjective again in the next puzzle, you don't get as much points because you're not being as creative. So you have to then, you know, throw in like a word like enormous or something like that. So it's kind of a fun little game. It's set in the DC universe. The uh, the reason why I think it really works is the character that you're playing has a unique power set and is thrust into the DC world. So you're really playing in Batman's world. You're playing in Superman's world with your unique power set. Along the way, you get to put in, you get to open up and unlock costumes that give you unique abilities. Like, remember Asbat's costume? Yeah. That's one of the unlockables. You can put that on your character, and then you've got, remember those wrist flamethrowers that he had? Yeah. You have access to those. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's like, it's fun as the game goes on and you progress and you do more unique things. You have the ability to access different character wardrobes. You also can create your own unique character wardrobes throughout the game. The amount of high-end, no, you know, well-known DC characters and your more obscure characters that are sprinkled throughout the game is fantastic. There's characters from the Great Ten in it, for example. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's really just a vast sprinkling of characters from the DC license. So it's fun. It's lighthearted. It's great. Uh, I really enjoy it because it's just something unique and different. Now, is this PC or system? Both. Both. So it's, you know, one of those games that are, um, it's, it's unique. I'm playing it on the PC. You know, I downloaded it through Steam, and I really like it. Um, but I know it's available for game systems as well. Uh, the other one that I'm really enjoying, they just released, it's one of uh, Telltale's, um, who did the Walking Dead game. Um, they released the episodic The Wolf Among Us, which is the Fables game. Hmm. And this is one of those, if you liked the old point-and-click games... It's kind of like that, um, and, and I mean, it really is at its premise that type of game, but nowadays they've so advanced the mechanics of them that it's a lot more interactive than it used to be. It's, I don't know if you ever played the game, Dreamcast game Shenmue, but um, it uses some of the mechanics from that type of thing, like quick timer events and things like where you can't just sit there and click you like have to be fully interactive. Like if you're in a combat fight situation, that is happening real time and you have to react according to the situation that's around you. It's it's like an interactive comic book. It's probably the best way to put it where there's certain parts of it where you're watching the story, you're making choices for the conversation. What I love about it though is conversation choices you make, action choices that you make affect 
the storyline. It affects the characters. Even to the point of which characters you're going to save or try to investigate first, because it's a murder mystery set in the Fables world. So if you choose to go to one person's situation instead of another's, that person might die, or you may not get the same kind of clues, or your investigation might go drastically differently. And I really love the fact that the choices that you make in the game, it's something they did in the Walking Dead game, have a benefit to it. So it has kind of a feel, too, of those old choose-your-own-adventure books. I don't know if you were into those. Oh, yeah. I, I was very into those. So it has a lot of different mechanics in it that make it a unique experience that go beyond the classic point-and-click adventure games. It's different. It's not for everybody. I'm really enjoying it, though. The art style is great because it feels right, really like a comic book. It feels like you're being thrust into a comic book world. And I'm a big Fables fan, so to be able to see, you know, your main character that you're following is Bigby Wolf, and to be able to play as that character and see all of the rich tapestry of characters that have been set in the Fables universe, uh, it's only the first chapter so far, it's episodic, there's going to be five chapters in all, that look like they're monthly-ish, if they're going to follow the same scheme as The Walking Dead. The Walking Dead followed that as well, roughly, because sometimes they needed to spend a little bit more time on a chapter, which never bothers me. I'd rather wait an extra week or two and have it released right than to have them rush it out to get it out on quote-unquote on time and it's not done right. But I like their games. Telltale's doing a nice job with their games, and they've got kind of a niche market in what they're delivering. And this is up there with the Walking Dead game for me. I, if you liked the Walking Dead game and you're a Fables fan, you immediately need to go pick up this game because it's right in that same vein and it's a lot of fun to play. The Walking Dead game to me was a complete home run, so this is in that same vein. So it's kind of nice to have other DC games being put out right now uh, you know, and showcasing, the vert to me, the Vertigo line is just, you know a rich tapestry for games like this. Fables is just uh, terrific. I'm just really enjoying the experience so far. Yeah, I can imagine Fables would be a good one to just to pull from. Just one, the characters are known as, you know, they're generally known by people, but then you have the the Fables spin to them, the little Fables twist to them, but the, you could be immediately comfortable with the character because you already know who the Big Bad Wolf is. You already know who, you know, Snow White, etc. are. Yeah, and one of the things that I like about this, too, is I'm hoping with something like this that people who are fans of Telltale's other games, like The Walking Dead, for example, maybe they'll pick up the Fables game and this will lead them to graphic novels. I hope. Because as you play the game, it unlocks like little biographies of each of the Fables characters. And, you know, to me, that's great. I mean, that's one of the nice things about properties like that is there's an opportunity for hopefully some crossover audience, even if it's just a few people, you know, to be reading the comics that maybe have never tried them before. And the Fables universe is so easy to jump on and trade that uh, I hope that that happens. To me, uh, that's one of the untapped markets, gaming, um, bringing those people to comics. It's baffling to me that we don't see more crossover with that. So I hope this leads to that opportunity. But this is going to be a big year. We're going to have um, Injustice, which I'm almost positive the PC version is coming out in November. And and that Game of the Year version is actually coming to the next generation systems as well. You know, the PS4 and the the new Xbox. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think the Vita as well, the portable. They're going to do a Game of the Year version of that. And then there's that Batman Arkham Origins, which also has a separate handheld version that's coming out that's going to be for the Vita and the 3DS, if I remember correctly. And that's a separate story from the main game. So it's cool to see that these characters are... And that's the thing. If you, if you do a Batman game right, people are going to want to buy it. <laughs> because he's a... I mean, he's a... What character do you want to run around as as a video game? Batman. I mean, why wouldn't you? And, and those Batman games have just been... You haven't had a chance to play those yet, have you? No, I haven't. And I keep telling myself I'm going to get a game system. I'm going to get a game system. And whenever I find myself in the store... To buy the system, I you know I either get confused or I'm like ah, I don't know I want to, ah, you know and then you know something will happen and I'll just like ah forget it and I'll just leave you know whether it's yeah you know, I've had people be rude to me I've had you know 
you know, loud screaming children who were starting to annoy me. Yeah, I've had various things that always occur. Whenever I'm about, I yeah, get in my head, okay, I'm going to buy something today. I'm going to buy the system. Something always stops me from buying it. So, you know, I don't know. I just, for whatever reason, I tell myself I'm going to get it, and then I change my mind at the, while I'm at the store before I'm able to ever get it in my hands. Jim Arrow was released last week, the, the first episode of Season 2. I was actually a little discouraged, only only because the I saw the thing about the ratings, and that the ratings were a little bit down, I guess. It fell 31% from last year's opening. Yeah. And that's something that I don't want to see happen, because this is a show that's really important to me. And I, I would... Do you think that with the day and age of, like... These fall openers are not on the same week. You know what I mean? Like, Arrow was weeks later than yeah. the traditional... I almost question why networks aren't doing, like, a bam. You know, the beginning of September or mid-September is, like, your time when everybody's going to be checking for the new fall premieres. They seem to be all over the place. Like, there's this um, almost, almost Human, I think, is the show... J.J. Abrams has one yeah. coming out. It's um, the guy who plays Dr. McCoy in the new Star Trek series. That's coming out November 4th. And, and forgive me if I'm off on the name of the show. But I, I, it's, I saw the preview for that, and I'm, like, really into it because some of the people behind Fringe are involved with it and shows that I really liked. But, like, that's really late to be starting a show. And I wonder how many people nowadays with the amount of competition – develop an interest in a different program because your sh- your old show isn't starting at the same time, if I'm making sense. Like, for me, Arrow, they could start Arrow any time of the year. They could start Arrow in December, and I'm going to follow it because I'm a junkie. But people who are maybe more of a casual fan of the show and liked it, what happens if they jumped onto something else in that time slot because of the fact that Arrow didn't start at the same time? It just seems like a strange way to roll out shows, and maybe I don't understand that, uh, but I thought the opening episode was fantastic. I guess that's why I'm being so nitpicky about that end of it, because I want to see this show do well, because <laughs> I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I encourage people, like, if you got friends who were casual friends, fans of it last season and they aren't watching it, Tell them to watch it, you know, to get back get back on board this show because we want this show to have numbers because between this and the flash and everything, so I don't I mean I don't think the ratings are bad by any stretch, but you know, it's for a season premiere with the ending they had last season. Yeah. You would have think you would have thought that the numbers would have been higher. Well, I- you know, um, with what you were saying about just where the odd time of year starting it and just being off, I gotta agree completely. And an example is the show that you know follows us, uh, the Tomorrow People. Mm-hmm. I saw a clip for it. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll watch that. But I had no idea when it started. And I recorded the season premiere of Arrow. I didn't watch it live because I couldn't. And so I'm watching it. I'm like, oh man, that was. It just started, so I missed the first episode of it. But then I went back, and I've now recorded it, and I'll find uh, the, the the pilot for that and you know, rewatch that episode. But that right there is a prime example of I knew the show was out there, but I didn't see it because I didn't know to record it. Because I think that's what we live more in nowadays is people do more of the recording and watch it later, and they you know they pull it up on demand. They don't sit down, and it's not just seeing it right at the moment. I know. The big networks had a couple episode, couple shows that I, I saw a clip here, a clip there. I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll watch it. But I never ended up watching any of them because I was doing this or I was doing that. There's no – I think because there's so many options out there for us and the DVRs and recordings and, you know, TiVos or whatever you're using, you know, we ignore the new episodes unless we flat out lock down and say, okay, I'm going to get this. I'm going to make sure to record this so I know I'm going to get the, the show and watch the show. And Almost Human was the name of the show that I was referencing earlier. I just wanted to correct myself so that way I get the right name out. That's the one I'm excited for. It's coming in November. I hate throwing stuff out there when I know I'm blatantly making a mistake or I could be making a mistake. Errol, let's talk about the episode, though, because for me, I was really excited for this. And I thought it really delivered a lot of bang, a lot of punch, exactly what I was looking for from Arrow. I wanted to see some forward character development. And this is something that I think Arrow did really well in season one, 
and continues into Season 2. High impact finale that pays off into a status quo change for Oliver that makes sense and starts leading him a little bit more in the direction of the hero that we know and love. And that's what's great about this journey. I feel like I'm journeying with him. It's something that I really dug about Smallville was that gradual journey. I like that Arrow's doing it differently in a way that makes sense for this character. But to see Ali in the beginning dealing with the fact that he lost his friend, Laurel dealing with the fact that she also lost him, and that this was somebody who Laurel was seeing, but then had a connection with Ali that resurfaced in the midst of all this. He dies, and they both have to deal with the after effects of that and what it means for them in a relationship. That was absolutely fantastic. I loved seeing that. It, and not only just the connection between the two of them, they had the bow chicka wow wow connection. And that even added to both their guilt and both their feelings because, you know, if it had just been a kiss, if it had just been a moment, that'd be one thing. But they, you know, continued it on and they were, you know, thinking maybe this is going somewhere and this, and that just completely, you know, kneecaps them with his death. They have no way of getting any closure. And I love how the fact that both of the characters reacted, you know, to the fact that they'll never truly get closure, you know. Um, you know, Laurel is going to always have that where she feels like she cheated on him. And just like how Ollie can sympathize with her because he had that, you know, with, uh, you know, with Laurel's sister. So there was that whole, just they each know the pain each other's feeling, but they know we can't, not, this is blocking us from being together. And I think that is a great way to keep them apart because I, I want to see them together. Don't get me wrong. But if you're going to have that, you know, they're not together, they can't be together, it's, I'm glad that it's a really cool story as to why they're not together. It's not just because of, hey, you know, uh, situations, this or, you know, uh, the, the traditional hero, I don't want to get her and put her in any harm's way. No, there's a solid reason why these two aren't together, and it's tearing them both up, but they both are honoring, you know, just this you know friendship this beyond you know the 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 never being able to make true retribution to um tommy absolutely i I think that's something that is really a key to the program i like that anytime you've got a show like this and it's not just about our main guy it's about the entire cast you've got me his whole family i like that the mom is not off you know the scene you know, she's still a part of this. The sister's still a part of this. These are characters, you know, we've got Roy Harper taking a much more prominent role this season, which makes sense. He left a gap. I like that there's a time passage that occurs that we don't know every little bit that's happened. We've seen that uh, Laurel's dad has been demoted because of some of his choices. We see Felicity and Diggle trying to pick up the pieces from Oliver and trying to come up with a way to bring him back, to get him back involved with what's going on in his city, and realizing that, okay, your original plan, your focus in your original plan, made you take your eye off the ball and what really you should have been doing. That's forced him to rethink himself and realize that he can't be this killer. Uh, He can't be what Tommy Merlin accused him of being. He needs to evolve, become something more. And that's something that I really enjoy. I love the scenes with Slade and Shadow. Mm -hmm. Being able to see that backstory still unfolding uh, is something that's really important to me. I like that there's a connection between this and the comic in its own way without being beholden. Uh, the, The echoes that are occurring in the current comic series are very welcome to me while at the same time it does feel like a unique story thematically it feels right though and i think right now is a good time for that it's a series that i i honestly if you're not watching it you should be because it's it's really terrific it's one of my favorite stories i love that walter Steele came back in this episode (laughs) well i kept the whole time as the show's going on where's walter where's walter Wait, and I'm like, I'm trying to remember, Walter didn't die. No, he's so, where's Walter? And finally, when Ollie's talking to his mom, and she's like, your family, all of them. I'm like, Walter! You know, and I 
you know, again, I'm really 100% backing the show. This is an outstanding show. I've been telling people at work who are into action, even if they're not comic book people, this is a cool action story. This has some great moments where we get some cool body counts. Now, what I mean by cool body counts, I'm talking the bad guys are killing people. Now, that's a terrible thing to say, bad guys killing people, that's horrible, but it adds an element of realism to it. You know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite shows was The A-Team. Absolutely loved The A-Team. Still to this day, we'll sit down and watch an episode of The A-Team. But even as a kid, I hated the fact that the villains would shoot thousands of rounds of ammo and not hit a single person. I think throughout the history of that show, only two people were ever shot. You know, and that always used to drive me nuts even as a kid. Well, Arrow, we don't have those moments. We have innocent people getting hit in, you know, the the targets getting killed, but also the person standing next to them is getting lit up. There is a serious and a realistic and just a violence to it, but it's not over-the-top violent where I wouldn't want, you know, a little kid sitting there watching it. I wouldn't want, you know, say, oh, this is, you know, condoning violence. No, it doesn't, but it, you know, it's not... You know, marshmallow. It, there is a nice balance between action, violence, but not gratuitous blood splatter gore. How long before Roy or Thea figure out that it's Ollie? I'm going to say Roy. Fi- I'm going to, you know what? I was going to say Roy figures it out first and Thea doesn't get it. But I'm going to actually say we got at least two seasons before Roy and Thea figure it out. Because I think they're going to have them either figure it out or he's going to show them. You know, but because so far no one's really figured it out. He's actually had to reveal to people that he is the Green Arrow. But I'm thinking it's going to be Roy is going to figure out that it's Ali. And it's going to be one of those street fight moments. And he's going to realize it's going to it's going to click in his head. Hey. You know, he's here and so is Green Arrow. He's here, so is, he's going to start putting two and two together because, you know, Roy is on the streets. He's actually, you know, in the trenches. And I think that connection is he's going to figure it out. But I'm going to say it, not this season, next season he figures it out. Okay, you see, I, I'm, it's funny. I'm in a different place than you because I feel like this season we're going to have one of them figure it out. Uh, or... You know, Ali have to take one of them, especially Roy, with what he's doing under their wing. And I could be wrong, you know, but uh, I'm I'm anticipating that this season. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, and, and to be honest, hey, if it, I'm going to put if anybody finds out, it's going to be Roy. Yeah, I don't think Thea is going to find out yet. I think we got a couple years before Thea finds out. Cool. And just because, and nothing against her, I I've loved how they've grown her because I was really now, scared. I, wait, hold on, hold on. Admit it's your hatred of her. What? Admit it's your hatred of her. Come clean. It's not my hatred of her. I think she's an awesome character. And <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just about to go on saying how I was terrified for her. With everything that happened, I was worried she was going to do that downward spiral and turn back into the more whiny um, Thea. And she's not. She you know, stepped up. She's yeah. running the bar. She's actually being mature and responsible. We had that great, you know, growth moments of realization between her and her mother. Yeah. So there's some, you know, I'm really loving that character. I was so glad that she's holding strong. That's where the show's a strong character drama. Because I wanted to see the moments with Thea and the mom. Like, that mattered to me. And that's when you, that's a sign when you've really well developed some characters. When you want to see those moments that aren't the, like, I, obviously I wanted all the action stuff. This show does a really good job of balancing out character drama, action. Character drama, action. In a way that doesn't feel forced. They, you know, know when to throw in a flashback sequence that has high action because it wouldn't make sense to have a modern day sequence with high action. But along the way, every one of these elements leads to strong character development in the past or in present day. And that's what's really great. They're developing a lot of characters at the same time. And I'm, you know, glued to find out more about who these characters are and what their background piece is. It's really a great use of the DC Universe. Multiple times during that premiere, I was saying to myself, wow, this really should be the Green Arrow of the Justice League. 
you know, it's uh, this universe, this is the way that you craft a multimedia DC universe. Marvel's got their Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show. This really should be a part of the greater DC universe. When they introduce a Flash television series that's coming out of this, I know you're going to you're going to mention something about this. Uh, this really to me, this you should be building this as a part of the greater movie universe, I think. Oh, definitely. I would love to see this be the transform, you know, this get meshed in with the DC universe and get actually put into you know, can't in the movie can and pull that into this universe and just have everything go that way. I think this again, it this is a great way to build up a, a knowledge and a fan base and not have to do multiple movies to introduce characters like the fat Flash and uh, Green Arrow. We've got them now. We're introducing them this way through the TV show. So we're introducing characters in the movies. Now we're introducing TV. Let's bring them together. Let's all play on the same page and everybody has fun. And we, the fans, get something we want. We get a solid Justice League movie where the characters are already developed and they're known and we get some cool action sequences. I can see this Ollie Queen going in to a higher level, going into the hero, becoming more of the, you know, introduce him to some more uh, trick arrows or maybe some even a little bit higher tech. He's got some cool tech right now. Maybe start kicking it up a notch. Maybe start introducing stuff that would combat a Kryptonian or would deal with a, you know, a Green Lantern or a Dark Side or whatnot. You know, this is something that we could really, you know, sink our teeth into and have fun with. And I'm, I'm very excited to see where the show goes and I'd love to see them get connected. How cool was it when he when uh, Felicity pulled out the bow? Yeah, you know, and showed him that uh, you know she'd been putting things together for his return, and he picks that thing up and you know was acknowledging how cool that was. I just really yeah. liked that. I thought it was just a really powerful moment on the show. I like in the comics the Team Arrow concept. I'm, I don't care at all that it's a different Team Arrow in the comics. I just I think the character of Oliver Queen works really well with a team. It makes sense that he would have a team. I know that the character of Green Arrow is not supposed to be a part of the Justice League movie, but I like the idea that maybe this will lead into the Flash, which will lead into the Flash being into the Justice League movie. You just kind of, those interconnectivities between these two universes, and there's no guarantee that the Flash TV show Flash is going to be the one in the film. They may do something different on that end. But to me, why? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'll be honest, with you, I I'll put, I'd put money down that he's not going to be because yeah. I don't think they want to cross over. And just like I don't think I would love to see Bruce Wayne in, you know, Green Arrow, you know, in Arrow. I would love to see Clark Kent, even if they're not going to do their their alternate, you know, introduce the one character, just have a little nod to the people. But sure. I don't think we ever would. Because I don't think they'll want to hit risk that crossover and they'll say, oh, we'll confuse people and yada, yada, yada. yada. The arguments that have always come out of uh, Hollywood about this crossover. Now, with Marvel doing it, with Marvel doing Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., hopefully DC will say, hey, you know, it's working for Marvel. They're, people aren't confused. People aren't uh, annoyed. Let's try it. So sure. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, but I don't think it'll happen, but I would love it for it, too. Who are all these confused people? I don't think the confused... Well, the confused people are non-comic book readers who maybe would watch a movie. Do we really, do we what, really believe... I guess this is... I, I take a little issue with this. I think that's a little bit of comic book snark. And, and I'll, let me explain why. It's, I really believe in the depth of comics in the depth of storytelling, in the depth of serial, serialized storytelling and what's going on. So I'm not diminishing anything about comics. But come on, it's really not that hard. I mean, yes, you have to play a little bit of catch-up ball sometimes, but like, if Bruce Wayne appears or is acknowledged in a wink and a nod on Arrow, who are these people that are going to get, wait a minute, Batman knows Arrow? Like, who are those people? that are going to like be really thrown off by that. Well, here's the thing. It's not it's not us. It's not people like us. What it is, it's the management, it's the studio executives. That's what I'm saying. Who have no idea 
who the regular everyday person is. The people who are so high up that they've forgotten what it's like to have to pump gas or buy a you know a thing of milk. These people who just completely have they're in the Hollywood universe that they've no idea they have no touch of reality. And those are the ones who make the calls. Those are the ones who say no, we can't we don't want this. And the people underneath it who are the writers, the people who actually are street level now, folks who say, "Hey, this will work," they're always out. They're overnumbered. They're out, you know, outgunned, and it's they're stuck. And I think that's you know what's always stopped. That's why I, I was think- very excited with the Marvel movie, with Marvel TV show doing the crossover. The Marvel people said, "Hey, let's do this," because right. again, it's a plus for Marvel that they have a stronger control over their movie empire. The comic book people know that people will figure this out, that people won't be confused, people won't be turned off. It's Hollywood studio execs who don't have a clue. The general public that are going to be that confused by the fact that Arrow knows Bruce Wayne are already confused by the show. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's just, if they're really, I mean, other than, like, I think your average person, and I'm talking about your casual person who maybe is not a comic fan, who saw the Batman movies, and just happen to know the name Bruce Wayne. Oh, cool! He knows Batman. I mean, that's really if if they make the connection, that's going to be the case. If the name doesn't mean anything to them, they're not going to instantly go, "Who is that now?" Arrow has since the beginning of it thrown out so many comic book references in the show, and it's been successful. Like, if you think about it, how many streets are named after comic book creators? How many yeah. cities that are... I mean, how many winks and nods to the DC yes. Universe have they sprinkled throughout this series? I don't think there's a whole lot... Of, they just... If they don't get it, it's because they just aren't connected to that. But you can still watch the show without making that connection. That, to me, the or you know the fact that somebody's going to go... Like, there's a Batman cartoon out right now. I really don't think the person watching the Batman cartoon right now is going... Oh, that's a different Batman from the movie. I'm confused. Uh, really? <laughs> Why do we think that? I mean, that's what I mean by snark. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's really. Oh, I agree with you. Man. I just it's I think ridiculous. that's I think that's silly, and I think it's limiting. I think you take good ideas of making connections. And naturally having your products support each other because you're so afraid of confusing people that just aren't going to get confused. I I agree with you. We are arguing on the same side on this one. And it's, you know, I, it, it does baffle my mind. And it's something that I try to, when I talk to the non, you know, the non comic book readers that I work with and that I know that I'm like, this is a show you guys would like. It's got enough action. It's got enough adventures. It's got some cool stuff going on. Give it a try. Give it a watch. I don't understand and non-comic book readers. What? I don't understand non-comic book readers. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't they? Come on. They confuse me. <laughs> yes. Do they not want to have fun? Do they not want to laugh and enjoy life? I do think, though, the the more readily available these characters are, you know, regardless of whether everybody who watches Arrow is going to become a, a reader of the Green Arrow comic, that's not reality, and that that won't happen with anything. I think seeing these characters appear more on television, seeing them appear in animation, seeing them appear in games, is only going to make an awareness of these characters. And I, I think there's an opportunity there for some of those people to jump on and try out comics, and and hopefully that's happening. So it's Black Canary at the end. We didn't really discuss Black Canary. What did you think of that? Oh, 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 oh man, I cheered. I I howled. I cheered. I was like, I hit rewind, watched that fight sequence over again. Once again, high action, really cool. I was hooping and hollering, man. I was like, yes, this is gonna get good. And you got everything that happened between Laurel and Ali going. Okay, now we've got another female into the mix, but. Roy's the one who saw her first. So this is going to be Roy's intro into it. And I kind of like that because you think about how the how in the comic she is, you know, or she has been so, you know, close and strong and so much of a support piece for Roy. I think it's kind of neat that our first introduction to the character isn't through Ollie, but it's through Roy. You know, something that caught my eye 
and well, caught my ear really during the uh, the opening episode of Arrow. It was a news clip that was going on, and it, it kind of was a background story to the main action going on. But they they said Star Labs was working on you know announced that they were working on starting and testing this new particle enhancer. And as soon as I heard that. The first thought that popped in my head was, holy crud, that's the origin of the Flash. Because they've already said that Flash is coming to uh, Starling City. He's the forensic scientist from Central City. He's going to be arriving into Starling because of a possible crossover you know, case where it looks similar there, doing some other stuff. But in, I'm thinking that's how we're going to see Flash get his powers. That this is going to be the intro of the meta. This is going to be the intro of all of that type of superhuman powers. I'm betting right there that it, that it's not going to be the traditional lightning bolt hits the chemicals that splash on him. It's going to be the uh, science lab experiment either goes wrong or the bad guys blow it up or whatnot. Who knows where the actual trigger and that's going to flip the switch. But that's where I'm saying we're going to get a uh, flash from. I was thinking it was going to be whatnot. Yeah, whatnot too. Mm-hmm. Plus, they also announced um, uh, Cynthia Adia Robinson is going to be playing Amanda Waller. Mm-hmm. Now, I've known her from the the Spartacus uh, TV, uh, you know, from Stars, you know, the Spartacus series, and I was actually very excited when I read that it was her getting it because. Yeah, she was one of those characters on Spartacus that went from the timid wallflower slave girl to this butt-kicking female gladiator who took no prisoners. So I've seen her soft, gentle, go into pure, hardcore, physical, and vicious. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, that'll make a good waller. <laughs> I want to shout out real quick DC Comics News because uh, you know, for a lot of the news from the New York Comic Con, I've been checking them out. And, you know, I, I'm really liking the site and how they do kind of summaries of the panels and things, so it's really great. So I just wanted to quickly shout their site out real quick. And the news that probably stood out for me the most and made me geek and smile was uh, the announcement of a Batman Weekly series. Yeah. Batman Eternal by James Tinian, the fourth, who I'm, I'm really loving his Batman work in general, but also that he's bringing back Stephanie Brown with a new origin that fits her into the new 52. I'm excited to see where that goes. I wanted Stephanie Brown back, but I didn't want that forced. I, I love the idea there's a weekly series. Uh, I'm curious to see what that's going to be all about. What do you think about a Batman Weekly? I'm doing a happy dance right now. Me too. I'm actually very excited for it, partially because of Stephanie Brown coming back. I was one of those people who's like, man, I do love, you know, that uh, Barbara's back, girl, but can we have Stephanie Brown too? Can we have two of them? Or just, you know, because the character was so wonderful. So I, I started doing the happy dance when I heard she was coming back because, like you, I'm, I got to give a thanks to, uh, you know, our friends over at uh, DC Comics News. You know, it's I'm sitting. I use just like how you did. I did the exact same thing where I'm pulling the the, the panels from the, the Comic Con from there. And I got to tell you, that was one of the things. As I was reading it, I was going woohoo! I was high fiving myself, you know, because there's nobody else here to do that. But it's you know, a kind of a really neat thing. Now, the Batman Weekly, again. Cool. I can go for more Batman, but when I heard the creative team on it, I was especially excited because I really like his handling of uh, Batman. I really like how he deals with Gotham and how he deals with those characters. So I'm very excited to see how this happens, how they're going to pull it off. Is it you know, one and dones? Is it going to be building stories? Is it going to be a combination of yes? Will we get other Bat Universe people in there? Is this, you know, how is this going to play out? So, yeah, there's a lot of questions running through my head as to what we're going to get, how we're going to get it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy and excited. Did you read Zero Year last week? The new... I, hold on. No, I haven't gotten to Zero yet. Okay. Uh, without spoiling anything major, we, we get to see Batman in the bat suit, and I'll leave the rest of where that storyline goes without... It was just, to me, it was a fantastic issue. I really loved seeing the bat suit. Uh, you know, to finally see, like, what his first version looked like 
which I thought was really a great touch. And I won't spoil any of what that looks like to you or anything other than to say that I'm really enjoying Zero Year. Uh, I know at the panel, one of the things Scott Snyder said for the Batman panel was that Zero Year is his favorite storyline out of the ones he's written. If there's any validation over the need to do this, it's how good this story is. It, I, I hearken it back to what Je- Jeff Johns did with his Secret Origins line when he was doing that through various titles that he was associated with. Snyder's doing this with Zero Year. Taking something that is very important to me, the origin of Batman, and telling it a way that makes sense for the new 52 while sticking to a, a core feel of what I feel that journey should feel like. I love seeing the relationship between Bruce and Alfred. To me, that is an absolute key to that series. You know, we want to, I want to see the strong foundations of that. There should be a familial-like relationship between them, and boy, is that being developed there between these two. They argue and bicker at times where it makes sense, but then they come together and smile and laugh, and you know, you can you have those high-five moments with them as well that comes from, and every other emotion in between, that comes from this real family feel that come, from their relationship, and I think Snyder just really gets that, and Yet it feels young and fresh and exciting. I love being excited about just this different take on Batman because at the core, it's the same guy. You know, and that's really yeah. important to me. You, you know, if you, can, you can revamp an origin. You can retell a story with a new lens as long as you understand the character. And oh, that, that's definitely apparent here. Oh, definitely. Yeah, the uh, the Zero stuff has been kind of cool for me. What do you think Again, about... They had to change some of the stuff that was canon. Is it? What? What do you think about Mark Andreco on Batwoman? And, and I'm sorry, if there's something else you want to say about Zero Year, please do that. Actually, it's just general reiterating what you were saying about how I was enjoying it. So I'll jump right into the Mark Andreco uh, Batwoman. Um, because I was one of those people who was upset about the change in... Uh, you know, in the title, the change in, you know, because I was really enjoying what the creative team was doing with Batwoman. I liked how the character, you know, was, you know, developing and how we were getting more of her personal life. And we're, because for me, I always enjoy seeing the life outside of the costume. I like seeing, and the fact that she didn't have the quote unquote traditional home life not only fit the character, but it was a nice breath of fresh air. I don't want the same thing for everybody. Give me something different. And we're getting it. Now, with Mark and Draco, I like his style. I like his, you know, his skills and his writing. So I can't sit here and say, oh, this is terrible now because I know who's taking over. I have to wait and see what happens because he's one of those people that I do trust um, their writing. I trust that he will I still will get that same type of character because that's the kind of uh, writer he is that he's not going to just, you know, discard stuff and say, hey, I got to do it this way. We're still going to get that same feel. So it's one of those things where I'm very sad to see the change because I've loved the, the creative team, but the creative team were getting in this I'm like, okay, I trust these people. So let's see what happens. And once I start reading the issues, once I get a couple issues with them at the helm, then I'll have a better grasp on how I feel about it. I can't wait to see in Red Hood and the Outlaws, Ra's al Ghul. Yeah. I think that was one of the things that I really enjoyed in Villains Month was seeing the Ra's al Ghul issue. And I I can't wait to see how that plays out because I'm loving Red Hood and the Outlaws. I've loved how the series has evolved as the characters have grown. And I think it's one of those one of those ones that I'm really looking forward to see. You know the one I'm kind of looking forward to? What? Catwoman, Joker's daughter. You know, she's going to be making yeah. her appearances in Catwoman. And I'm really excited for that. That was a character. Joker's daughter was somebody from the Villains Month that I was like, man, this... This crazy you know, young lady is kind of cool. I want to, you know, she is, she is a crazy. So there's crazy you can always have fun with, but she's not, you know, ridiculous crazy. She's not, you know, off crazy. It's still it's there's this a nice level of viciousness, craziness, but also some intelligence to her. So there's gonna be some neat moments when she and Catwoman are going back and forth, you know, and going one on one, and and the Ched. 
Nocenti is really cool with how she's re- how she wrote the character in Villains Month. So with her doing you know her in Catwoman, I'm like, hey, this is going to be some neat stuff coming from Catwoman. Are you reading Batman Beyond 2.0? I'm getting it digital, but I haven't read it recently. Okay, Kyle Higgins is doing that, and he was mentioning in the uh, the DC Entertainment panel how he's allowed to kind of push that universe in any way that he likes. I like that because, you know, those animated series came to an end. So there's an opportunity there to further evolve and continue the story or to stay, like, trapped and pigeonholed in, like, we've got to be beholden to only what happened in the animated universe. At this point, there's no reason to do that. Continue these characters moving forward. Because I really liked that those the animated universe felt like it had forward progression so i want to see that in the comics that are supposed to be the aftermath of that the continuation of that world so i'm excited to see that kyle higgins on nightwing is to me like if they can lock him into a permanent contract on this character they need to do it because he just so gets how to make an engaging nightwing comic month in month out i would argue that uh, his Nightwing is up there with the work of Chuck Dixon. And I mean that not as diminishing Chuck Dixon, but complimenting Kyle Higgins. Because I loved Chuck Dixon's Nightwing. That was really terrific stuff. And Kyle Higgins is capturing that same sense of wonder that I always enjoyed when Chuck Dixon was originally introducing the series. It feels like that kind of vibe again. I'm anxious to see what's going to happen with this character with the secret identity being revealed. How does that affect him? That's a huge status quo change. And not only how it affects him, but the others who surround him, such as Bruce. Yeah, and that's something they didn't answer at the panel, because there was, I guess there was somebody who asked them about that, and they just basically gave them, hey, wait and see. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are they going to keep it? Are they going to, is there going to be a giant swerve? Is, what's going to happen there? And then with, especially with Nightwing in Chicago, you know, with him changing from Gotham to, you know, changing towns. You know, how long is he going to stay in Chicago? Because I do enjoy him there. I like how he's kind of has his own little city. He has his own city, and they can do some more stuff with it. But I do miss him in Gotham. I I liked seeing him in Gotham because then we get the moments of him interacting with the other characters. We get those at any point in time, one of the other bats could swoop in or he could swoop into their title. And that's something I always enjoy seeing because you think about just how vast Gotham is. It's not just one person who's on the streets handling it. There is Team Batman there. There are multiple people who are dealing with the various neighborhoods and sections of Gotham. And I've always liked that we got that style and we got that feel to it. So with Nightwing and Chicago, I do go, oh, it's neat. There's some cool stories and I agree with you on how cool the title has been lately but i do want him in gotham scott snyder was talking about the 75th anniversary story for batman and saying that that next year it's going to be the biggest and craziest story for batman i'm really excited for that i like that uh, there's a plan to mark that anniversary with something special for us as the reader because i love stories that feel celebratory you know, we did this big thing with Superman at 75, which I really greatly enjoyed. I'm really excited to see what they do with Batman at 75. Snyder also talked about uh, some of his Vertigo work, such as The Wake, and uh, how that issue 5 is going to be like close to the f- the close of the first half of the story. And I'm really... Have you had a chance to read The Wake? No, I haven't. It's terrific. I- I'm really loving the resurgence of the creative side of the Vertigo end of things. Um American Vampire is coming back, and it's going to jump 10 years into the future, into the 60s, and that the characters will find themselves in places you would not expect. I'm excited for that. Uh, American Vampire has been one of those really terrific books in the sense that you're following through eras. I love the sense of history that these are characters, because of the fact that they're vampires, their story is not one that's going to end in the past. It's going to be gradually moving towards present day. But I want to go on that journey with them. And I'm, I'm ready for a jump to this era. I'd love to see how this works out in the 60s. <laughs> what a great, great title. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's a writer. If you're enjoying his Batman work and you haven't read any of American Vampire or The Wake, uh, 
you really need to do yourself a favor and check out those books. You're in for a treat. You know, this is a great way if you're like, ah, you know what, I'm reading a lot of superhero comics and I'd love to try something new. Start you know, gravitating towards some of the authors that you know and love and try out some of their work in the other lines because it's just kind of a great way to see some of the other material that's going on. I, I think the stuff that Vertigo has coming out is really got me excited. And, uh, you know, I, there's uh, Hinterkind and Coffin Hill that I have on my slate to read this week. And uh, I'm, I'm actually, those are probably going to be jumped up to be reading after I'm done with this episode because I'm, I'm just really into the whole Vertigo resurgence that's going on. Uh, and uh, I, I'm hoping that it's highly successful for them. Zero year tie ins. Nightwing's yeah. got one coming up. There's an Action Comics one coming up. Uh, you know, I mean, there's more than that. What do you think about tie-ins, like, with this particular storyline? I'm into it because I feel that they're they're targeting characters that would be impacted by Zero Year, and I want to see more because I'm just digging that story so much. Especially, I, I'm anxious to see a Superman book in particular echoing what's going on in Zero Year. You know, and it, it says it's it's Action Comics number 25 is the Zero Year tie, and it features the reintroduction of a major character. I don't know who that is. But I'm kind of excited to see how that's going to play out. Yeah, I like the zero year tie-ins. I like how they're doing that because we have these characters, and if we're going to have this universe, we need to, you know, it's it's not just a zero year of Batman. It is the zero year of the universe. Give us some stories as to where it happened. Show the young Batman, the young you know, Clark, and let's get into this let's you know flesh this out and i kind of was excited because they said uh, superman 25 is also going to be uh hell's going to return so there's going to be some more going on with that mm-hmm. where you know i guess we round 2 or round 3 however you want to call it superman versus hell so well or hell or however you want to pronounce it we kind of need to see the ramifications of what happened in villains exactly. month <laughs> so i'm excited for that because well, the fight with him, you know, what happens? Like, how do you resolve that? Now there's a paradox. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I, I always just, I'm like, when we start getting with the time and the altering time and paradoxes, I'm one of the first people who get a headache, you know, so oh, I, I love, always. I love that stuff. <laughs> I, hold on. I love it too, but I, I do admit I get the headache because my head starts spinning because, I don't just think A, B. I think A, B, C, Z. You know, and how did I go from C to Z? Well, that's just how I think. So it's when you start going with the time paradoxes and the time jumping, I can cause even more pain for myself than what the actual story is going to do. So I'm very curious to see how they're explaining this, how they lay this out. Because, again, these have been some cool creative teams. These have been stories that I'm like, okay, I'm liking how this is going. I like where this is heading. This is some cool excitement. Let's keep it going. So there's a trust and a confidence I have with the uh, stories. So I'm like, okay, if I've got this faith, I'm just going to sit back and ride and enjoy it. Because when I start saying, hey, what about this? What if this? What if? When I start throwing that question out to myself, that's when I get in trouble. And that's what I, mean, you know, I get this whole notion. It's going to be this, and then it's not that. And I'm like, wait, uh, okay, yeah. And then I, I confuse myself. <laughs> I, I admit it, I do. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, it's half the fun of comics is that, you know what the great part about that is? Uh, I, I do think with comics and with stories in general, they're open to being interpreted in so many different ways. That's half the fun. You know, book, did you read the first issue yet of Superman Wonder Woman? Oh, God, yes. Yes. <laughs> I love that Zod's coming to that book, but oh, my gosh. that and we'll, Actually, we'll talk about that a little bit later more in depth because I think we really need to have a meteor <laughs> discussion about Yes. That. Oh, my God. Uh, I I love that, and that's going to be a heavy spoiler you know, <laughs> focused you, you because know, there was some cool moments. You know what I love about that? Especially the ending. <laughs> it feels so different than Batman Superman. And, and yes. I th- it's shown that there really is room for both books to be out there. They're really delivering something different. I'm enjoying both titles greatly for very different reasons, and that's cool that they don't feel like, oh, it's just the same kind of thing. You know, we got a team-up book with Batman and Superman. It's so different because of the two characters that are involved, and I love that both writers have really embraced that. I like that it's two books with Superman. 
Yeah. Usually that's a Batman thing where you have, you know, multiple Batman team up books. It's cool to see Superman getting a little bit more exposure. So, you know, I like that because I'm, I'm enjoying Superman. I want to see more of what's going on with him. I think there's a, the creative teams that are getting involved with the character now are, are kind of giving us a different sort of, you know, evolution of Superman. And uh, there's, a, there's an excitement for me in Superman that is growing in a way that it hasn't since he was originally launched. I've enjoyed the character since the beginning of the New 52, but there's a difference to, for me personally in a level that I think goes back to when Scott Lobdell took over. Um, I've always liked the work that Grant Morrison was doing over there introducing the new version of Superman, but I felt like Superman, other than that, was kind of floundering, and I feel like the character's really now coming into his own, and, and there's an excitement there. Like, I'm really digging reading Superman. I jump to the Superman titles right now, and and it's nice to see that evolution, and, and I'm, I want to see the character in Team Ups. Like, I was excited for that book, Superman, Wonder Woman, and really delivered. Oh, God, yeah. And this is another really cool Wonder Woman story where we're seeing, you know, some more of her. And I've always wanted a second Wonder Woman title. I always wanted them to, you know, give us a little bit more. And this is a great way to do it. This is now showing the relationship side, sewing, but also it's still the hero. It's still the really hardcore Wonder Woman that I really dig. And we're seeing that that wonderful character that, you know, came through that had that code of honor, that code of conduct that, you know, you know, developed over time, we're seeing the birth of that development. She's still a little rough in the edges, you know, especially around, you know, with when you start looking at the clean cut of Superman, she's still a little bit rough, but you're going to see the polish come out. You're going to see this hero and this role model and this ambassador and this, you know, just the intelligence of Wonder Woman. And dare I say, strategery of Wonder Woman come out because oh, she is do. the Amazon warrior. <laughs> strategery. Um, Every episode, man, I got to figure out a way to put it in. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh-huh. <laughs> I get emails from people if I don't put it in. They, hey, I, what happened? These, but you don't understand that the people that are emailing you that are the same people that would get confused by Bruce Wayne being on <laughs> Arrow. Anybody that would email you and say, Jim, can you get more strategery into Raging Bullets? Those are those people. <laughs> And they're the reason why we don't have that right now. <laughs> so I take issue. <laughs> Supergirl number 25. I'm really excited for this because since Superboy was introduced in the, the new origin with the clone, her issues with him because of the Clone Wars on Krypton, I want to see that. I love that she's going to have to face that. Knowing what she knows about him and how she's growing to accept that relationship to try and deal with, you know, what is that going to do with them? I'm re- This has been something that has been teased since the Zero issue, you know, of that, that Superman Zero issue way back yeah. when. We're now finally going to start seeing that. I love how long this has taken to pay off. For some oh, reason, God, yeah. the build to this, I think it's just been fantastic, and I'm really, really excited to see what's going to go on next in the Superman books because this is a storyline that I've been greatly anticipating. Yeah, oh, definitely. With, you know, the Clone Wars of Krypton and just Supergirl's dealing with it. Because Supergirl is another title that they're really taking their time with and they're doing it right. And she started off as that she didn't speak any English. And she was just throwing punches whenever anybody came near and she had that more wilder edge to her. And then as she started learning, as she started feeling, you know, and get understanding what it is to be on Earth, she sacrifice basically crypt you know the possibility of bringing back krypton so it would save earth and we saw that you know just that hero moment so you know and then after that she kind of like you know it's the you know dealing with all the grief dealing with the fact she lost krypton for her to go back throughout the clone wars for her to deal with all that stuff i'm really looking forward to seeing just more personal growth of her 
Jim, I want to shout out real quick before we kick into some comic book talk. I want to shout out a fellow podcast. Do you like comics? Do you like the greatest heroes of them all? Then you should be listening to the Society of Leagues podcasts. Co-hosts Mark and Jeremy talk about the Justice League and Justice Society from the comics to TV and games. We are a bi-weekly podcast, and we hope you all enjoy. So, um, the friends of the show, and Mark and Jeremy were both those Google Hangouts, those Raging Bullets Google Hangouts that were going on for a little while. They were um, recording those, and through that, the two of them just you know, got into this idea, hey, we've got the bug, let's do a podcast. I think it's fantastic. And uh, they're two great guys. And if you haven't had a chance to check them out, it's the Society of Leagues podcast. And there will be a link to their podcast in our show notes. So I want to wish the guys the best of luck and very welcome to the world of podcasting. Cool. Spinning with great speed, the Flash creates a protective vacuum around himself. Jim, for our first comic chat on this episode, I want to talk. We want to talk about <laughs> Superman and Wonder Woman, yeah. the Power Couple issue number one. Charles Sewell, writer; Tony S. Daniel, pencils; Bat on inks; Tommy Omori on colors; Carlos M. Mangual on letters; Daniel and Bat with Mori on covers; Cliff Chang, Aaron Cruder with Ava De La Cruz on the variant covers. Ricky Purden is the associate editor and Eddie Berganza group editor. And I want to apologize to Charles because I think I butchered his last name, but I'm not 100% sure. You know, you kind of get a name in your head and you won't let it go. I'm not sure if I have the correct pronunciation of his last name. And I definitely want to shout him out because he is fantastic. What a great first issue. <laughs> And as always, Superman was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, and Wonder Woman was created by William Moulton Hart Marston. Did you forget to buy the special arrangement with the Jerry Siegel family? No, oh, bye. <laughs> this first issue, first Tony Daniels art. Oh my gosh, the whole art team should be commended. I mean, this is how you put together an art team on a book. What a gorgeous title. The action sequences... There were some, like, the opening page had me. You ready? I am. Then let's go. Just beautiful. I love the sunshine breaking through the clouds, the lasso kind of whipping around, just the whole look and everything. There should be a certain majesty to these characters, and when you get to the double-page spread, you continue with that, like, majestic look that makes you go, I want to be them, you know, you, you want, or you want to just be there with them. And a part of that whole thing, because they make flying look fun. <laughs> and that, to me, is what flying should look like. You should, you should envy that. You should want to do that. And this issue made me feel that way. Oh, God, yeah. This was, I was really excited to uh, talk about this one. Just story was incredible, but this visual treat of this artwork was absolutely fabulous. And, you know, I want to get a second issue just so I can take it apart and take the cover and you know frame it and put it on the wall mm -hmm. because just the fold out cover front back and then the extra piece looks absolutely just wonderful and I'm like oh my god this is and then you get stuff you know you get scenes inside it where they're flying side by side and when they're standing there just that are you ready you know and just that those moments I was like yeah I was hooping and hollering and it was only like the very beginning of the issue you know, so that was something I was like, ooh, this is, you know, it's one of those, it grabs you right away, gets you going, yes, you know, from day one, from moment one, that I was like, oh, this is nice. I am one of the biggest advocates for they didn't need to end the super marriage, but I got to admit, I'm digging this. <laughs> <laughs> I got to yeah. admit, I'm really digging this. This is cool. The relationship with Wonder Woman. I love the change in narrative. You know, where you've got Superman leading things in one minute from his internal dialogue, Wonder Woman leading things the other minute from her internal dialogue, and how the two of them are feeling each other's out the way you would in any normal relationship. Any relationship has those moments of doubt, self-doubt, doubting the other person, paranoia, wanting to inject that part of yourself, that respect. You want to know that that other person respects you for who you are and what you bring to the table. But then at the same time, questioning yourself that goes along with it, it, it has realistic emotions here that any couple would have. That's one of the things that I really loved about it. Like, I love 
that these characters are super powerful. They show a vulnerability, an emotional vulnerability in this. And that makes me love them even more because they don't get diminished by this. To me, they feel stronger because of the fact that in spite of all of that, they're able to work past that. It's just really terrific. Yeah, especially I'm digging how... You know, Diana's having issues with them being kind of secretive. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's even, but it makes perfect sense for Clark. And when she's having her training session, you know, with uh, uh, Hasia, you know, and it's she's like, hey, look at how he grew up. He grew up keeping the secret. He grew up hiding the side of him, keeping it personal. And even Clark and Diana have these conversations going back and forth about, hey, this is. You know, right now, I just want it us. I don't want to share us with anybody else. I just want it to be the two of us together. And I I like just his mindset and how he's thinking. It's not about not wanting people to know. It's not about, you know, wanting to keep the secret. It's about just that, that personal connection. It's about it's just them. And that's something that's really cool for him. And, you know, she's but. She's the Amazon. She's the celebration of life, the promo, you know, pronunciation, just the declaration of what's going on. And it's, you know, a cultural, you know, differences. And you think of just a super couple would have super problems, but they also have these regular, everyday, normal problems where upbringing and culture kind of lead to fights, arguments, discussions, however, whatever yeah. level it goes. Yeah. And that's one of the keys with it. I also love that when in this, you know, you're mentioning her training sequence, but we also see Superman with Cat Grant, and it's always fun to see characters like this in their natural worlds, their natural habitats, fitting in, but thinking of each other and their relationship kind of affecting their dialogue with others, kind of feeling out, does anybody have some advice they can give me? Because it's hard for them to have that balance of you're, you're doing these amazing things. You're getting thrown through planes, you know, when you're fighting storms. And, you know, the question is feeling out a team up. Like, I like that their team up doesn't necessarily feel as clean as even Superman and Batman's team up does, if I'm making sense there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's they're both very strong, but they're used to being strong independently, having to learn how to work together and us learning that. I want to see them grow as a team. Like, I want to see them become a polished unit. I can't wait for the issues where we start seeing some team dynamics develop with these two. And if that doesn't happen in this book, it's a missed opportunity because I don't want to see that bam right away. I want to see that grow. I want to see the mistakes made along the way. I want to see them have these issues that we're seeing right now. This is where I think the writer's hitting a home run. This is exactly how it should feel at this stage in this partnership. Yes, Yes, they're teamed together in the Justice League, but that's very different than buddy copping it. There's a huge distinction between being a part of a squad and being partners. And I like that that's being showcased here. It just feels fresh. Well, and you think about just Diane even mentioned to Clark about how she's had the more training. She's had that combat training where Clark has these superhuman powers. He's super fast. He's strong and whatnot. He's got that arsenal of powers that he pulls from. But she does have that meticulous training. There was, I'm thinking back to in the Justice League, and I can't remember which issue or which creator even, but it was the older, it was the older Justice League where they're talking about who's faster, Batman, um, Superman or Wonder Woman. And Bruce threw out the comment of who's faster, Bruce Lee or Julian or Ulan Bolt, you know, the, the, the runner who's like the fastest man on two feet, but is he technically faster than someone like Bruce Lee, who's got that, who can fight just, you know, on second nature and instinct and not even think about throwing a kick, throwing a punch? That is the two of them, you know, and I think that is something I'm looking forward to seeing the, the combat and the training and, you know, some sparring sequences maybe between Diana and Clark, just, you know, her sharing with him some of the Amazonian training, some of the knowledge that she has. It's... Something that could be a definite cool opportunity, again, to increase the character, increase the growth, increase the bond between the two of them. You know, the, you know, the couple that fights together usually stays together. 
As long as the fighting <laughs> is together, not right. against each other. Yes. Right. And I think they're trying to feel their way through that. How do we address some of the issues we're having as a partnership? Because that's part of any relationship, too. The dialogue that they're having here, this is, this is a great couple's book. You know, I mean, in the sense, like, you, there's a lot of metaphors here that I think any couple can work off of. You know, because it's not clean. Um, you know, there's, there's issues where the two of them are talking through things, and she's trying to vocalize some of her concerns and what she brings to the table. I love when he brings the flower from the fortress and she's like why don't you share more of these wonders with the world but he's talking also about the amount of threats that are there and the dangers of opening that up to the world the interesting part between the two of them is they're both right he needs to loosen up a little and open himself up she needs to maybe pare back a little bit and be a little bit more secretive in this world and learn how to have a light life that's out of the spotlight, which is something that I've really liked in the New 52, that he's trying to introduce her, how to be Diana Prince, how to have that secret identity, how to live under the radar, and to get to know the world from that perspective. So I love how th that stuff is not being igno ignored, it's being expanded here. And I think that's really just a great opportunity that was taken here to show us something new today. And I like that. I did like the line, though. It's beautiful and a little bit strange. It made me think of you. And, and, and it worked for him. <laughs> yeah. He was able to deliver that line, and he didn't get hit. <laughs> Except that I liked her comeback. Oh, Clark, yeah. if I wanted smooth, I'd be with Hal Jordan. <laughs> The whole bit with the sword, or the dagger, I guess, was really fantastic. Oh, well, that's a sword. That's definitely a sword. Yeah. And, I, again, I like the fact that, you know, it was the smith who made it. So we know this is something special of a blade. You know, and she's even saying, hey, this is, you know, part of her, part of her world. This is, again, she is that warrior. She does have that. And there is going to be the time when... We're going to see the reckoning of how is Clark going to deal with her taking a life if she has to in combat? Because we know Diana will do it. Now, she's not, you know, bloodlust. She's not killing everybody in sight. But if she's up against an epic level villain and we see her about to go up against an epic level villain, will she take a life? Will she go for the kill shot? You know, whereas Clark won't you know, necessarily go for a kill shot. I'm. Really, that's something that when they first introduced the concept of these two dating, that I was always curious if they're going to go, when they're going to have that conversation, when they were going to have that moment, when when those two would have to deal with it. And as we see this couple, as we see them getting closer and closer, part of me doesn't want that to happen because I'm worried that it would break him up. But then again, part of me is like, I want to see that because that'll be a really cool moment. You know how you know it's an epic level villain? Anytime you see the word Thum, that should really be the introduction to an epic level villain. That should be reserved for that. Because it's the only time Thum would make sense. Because when else do you use that? <laughs> Thum. <laughs> well, and, you know, again, when that hit, I was like, what the heck, Thum? I'm thinking, okay, complete shock when you flip the page. Yes. And you see it's doomsday. Dude, I cheered. I howled. This was a moment of, oh my god, yes! Because this right here is the fight I've always wanted to see. I've always wanted to see Wonder Woman versus Doomsday. Granted, Wonder Woman's not physically as strong as Superman is, but she is the warrior. And you know that sword is going to cut Doomsday. If that sword can cut you know, Clark, you know it can cut Doomsday. And this right here was a moment I was like, oh man, this is going to be a fight. This is going to be a slobber knocker. I was really, really excited when I saw this first page. And this is one of those issues when issue two comes out, I'm probably going to pick it up digitally because, you know, with me getting my paper copies, I, I, they don't, I don't get them on Wednesday. I get them on Thursday, you know, because of the mail. I may, you know, have two copies of this just so day one I can start reading it immediately. I, am, I was cheering, excited, and just, yes! I love the silhouette version, like, of them in the background that led us back to the beginning of the book. You know, I love how that the ending of that story 
Yeah, you know, the ending yeah. of that narrative makes you go back to the beginning and actually follow the action all the way to the ending again. That was really well done. I like those type of flashbacks where you can kind of trace it right back to the beginning. It, it's really a terrific issue. You know what I'm really liking nowadays? Sometimes in the past when you would have a team-up book, it was kind of a throwaway. You know, it would, and I, I always liked them because to me it was cool to see the two characters together, to have that one off storyline between them that just didn't matter. Fine, but it was cool, you know, it was a fun book and enjoyable. So I want to be careful when I say that. I, I'm not saying I didn't like that stuff. I grew up loving that stuff because it was a chance to see characters you didn't often seem together team up. In this case, though, I love that this story is echoing what's currently going on relationship-wise with them in the main universe. I feel like it's helping us to get to know them better, both in, as a team, but solo. I feel like I'm learning more about them as characters. That's just really great writing. You know, and any time that you've got something that tight, that feels like it really connects nicely to both of those solo titles, that just shows that the writer's really on the ball. And... I appreciate that. I think that gives this book a lot more impact. Anything else you want to say about this one? Woohoo! <laughs> Alrighty, let's go on to Earth 2, number 16. The writer is James Robinson, pencils Nicholas Scott, with inks by Trevor Scott, uh, colorist Pete Pantazis. The uh, letters are ooh, Denzi Sienti, S I E N T Y with uh, covers by Juan uh, Doe and assistant editor Anthony uh, Marquet, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, with editor Mike uh, Cotton and Eddie Braganza, group editor. And again, this was one of those where I want to make sure I am giving full credit to all creative team on this story and art because both are wonderful and absolutely beautiful. How, I how was do we fix so this? excited? How do we fix this? Like, the, the, what? How do you like? How do you read this book? Like, whatever he wants, give to him. Like, James Robinson has to stay. Like, this book is perfect. It really is. This is this is my favorite. I don't know if you call it team book, whatever. Every issue, all sixteen issues. First of all, the whole creative team needs kudos for that because, and, and I want to, beyond the 16 issues, when you're talking about things like um, annuals and stuff like that, you know, this has been a book that has just been a nonstop poem run. I love the development of this world. Oh my gosh. I, you know, I've drooled many episodes over the work of Nicholas Scott on this show. And, uh, I mean, it's just this whole Steppenwolf sequence. We're following a villain, and I love every minute of it. I mean, just really, really great development. And what I loved about that, that's how you build a swerve. You focus so heavily on him at the beginning that we don't see what's coming. Because I certainly didn't see where his story was going. <laughs> no, no, that was like one of those holy crud, man. Because I'm like, this is Stephen Wolf. He's born to be wild. You go up against him, you fire all your guns at once, and, you know, maybe explode into space. It's, you know, this is the kind of nasty, nasty villain that he is. Massive, massive power levels. And I was absolutely just like, holy crud, this is cool. The whole time I'm sitting there, and, you know, it's cool read, beautiful artwork. So this right here was an absolute home run on epic proportion. Just, you know, everything was just going, yeah. You know, excitement. But then at the end, we get that beautiful swerve. And I'm like, okay, I, I didn't see that one coming. Wow. Um, and we even kind of teased that it could happen or we we kind of teased, you know, who is in the background. But we definitely didn't. I don't think either one of us said it was possible that, uh, well, Steppenwolf would be gone. <laughs> no, I didn't see that. I totally thought, well, I'm not going to throw out there. I totally thought that was Superman. And I'm not the only one. I mean, that was... Right. You know, that was pretty much so. There's a lot of people on the internet that felt the same way with that. But forgetting any of that, I never saw that part coming. I really like that. You know, that he's not a background character. He's there as a representative of Darkseid. I even love that his vision, it kind of works like the Omega Beam. Yeah. So, you know, how, how much of him is still Superman and what else is he? I just thought that was really, really great. The thing I also love, though was seeing 
they got their butts handed to them. You know, you've got um, Adam Smasher and, um, or Adam, you know, Flash and Red Arrow and stuff like that. All these characters, you know, Green Lantern, obviously, Dr. Fate. These are characters I love. Michael Holt, you know, Sandman. They've, they've really done a great job at introducing us to these guys. I care when these characters are going through things. They, you know, I mean, the great turmoil to see characters rise up. That, to me, is the best part about this comic book is that these characters feel vulnerable. They feel like they're new to what they're doing. And even though that we know that they've got great powers, they're going up against great powers. And that kind of sense of, even though these guys aren't all on the same quote-unquote team, because they really aren't, they came together in a very strange circumstances. They aren't all buddies, so to speak. And yet, they have to come together and step up. And maybe this is what brings them together as a team. You know, their their mutual respect of being comrades in arms. I really love that. I did not see not only Superman rising up as being dark. So I saw that being Superman, but I didn't see that coming out so quickly. But this cr- beginning of the creation of an apocalypse on Earth. Oof. Yeah. Oh, man. And the... I love the fact that this team who, in a way, there's parts of the team that want to arrest the other part. Mm-hmm. It's not only that they're not even a team. There's open animosity and open, I'm going to capture you and lock you in a small room and dissect you type of mindset. They go from that to combat. They get their butts handed to them, and now they're regrouping. But in the process of regrouping, what are they doing? They're pulling out the innocents. They're getting these, you know, the humans, the regular everyday people out of there. And that's something I always love reading in a comic book because you have to have that mindset of the innocents first. We've got to get these people out of here. Yeah, we've got this massive epic uh, battle ahead of us and we're in the middle of, but we can't let these innocent people get crushed and killed in the process. I loved seeing the teamwork, seeing the Flash, seeing Green Lantern do their thing and get people out of there while you know the main fight's going on while dr fate's throwing out some spells and you know and everybody's doing their part they still are going for the rescue still doing for the protection of the innocents that was a great team moment for me it was again it was one of those things where i'm like yes we're seeing the wonders come together the wonders of america we're seeing the justice society we're seeing whatever you want to call these guys they're coming together they're forming a team I love the lines after uh, he chops up Steppenwolf. Idiot. Fool. He called himself a god. He calls us his dogs. We are not pets to be trained. We have one aim. The conquest of Earth. Steppenwolf foolishly fought for himself. Let me make my intentions clear. Hail Darkseid. Ooh. Oh my god, dude. That was absolutely just wonderful. And, again, we talk about just how we didn't see it coming, but even after the first my first read-through, you know, it still had that moment. Even right now, as we're talking, I look at that scene where he basically cuts him in half, vaporizes him. I still cheer. You know, again, it's thinking, how are they going to fight this now? This is Superman. Mm-hmm. This is evil, corrupted, mentally turned and whatnot Superman. How do they fight that? How do they defeat that? Especially given they're already on the ropes. They've already been beaten. And the guy that beat them up just got vaporized in a heartbeat. So now you're going up against you. You you weren't fighting. You know, you're trying to throw down. You're trying to hold your own. And you were getting beat up. The person who was kicking your butt just got completely vaporized. And now you have to fight that guy. Good luck. I love that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Great heroes need great villains, and a great team needs an un, um, a never-ending, just that unstoppable villain that how are they going to face this? Because not only do they have someone, a corrupt version of Superman they're going up against, they have Apocalypse. They have the coming of uh, Darkseid and all his minions and everything that can come out of that. So it's multiple fronts they have this battle they're going to have to deal with. And the thing that always did question, I'm like, wait, what about Hawkgirl? She had her own little adventure going on. What is she going to get? How is she going to get pulled into this? 
Tom Taylor, who's writing the current Injustice Gods Among Us comic, it looks like is going to be taking over for James Robinson starting the next issue. So this was, I guess, Robinson's last issue. Oh, man. <laughs> Except, have you been reading the Injustice Gods? This is not taking anything away from James Robinson, because um, he was amazing. Uh, but Tom Taylor, have you been reading the Earth 2 tie-in? I mean, the Injustice Gods Among Us tie-in comic at all? No, I haven't. It's really, really good. So, And I guess Nicholas Scott's remaining on as the artist. Oh, okay. is, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I'm incredibly sad that James Robinson is leaving. But I'll take that writer because he's really doing a bang-up job on that. Like, normally comic tie-ins, I guess I shouldn't even say normally. I think comic tie-ins are getting much, much better to video games. Um, have t- Traditionally, in the past, tie-ins in general to other media products have been a little watered down. There's been a bar that's been raised, I think, lately, from the animated tie-in straight on through to this, uh, you know, that, I mean, this Injustice has been a terrific comic. So I'm excited about that being the writer if we're not going to have James Robinson. Ideally, I would want James Robinson, but uh, I'll take this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well... I'm as I'm gonna wait and see. You know, I I I don't re- remember reading any other guy's stuff. You now, now the plus is that Nicholas Scott's still gonna be on there, so I'm still gonna get my beautiful artwork. Okay, so I'm happy there. I'm happy there. So that's gonna that's gonna lessen the pain. But uh, you know, I definitely uh, you know I got to give the guy a shot. You know, and in the way I am with any creative team change, especially a writer. It's got to be at least one full story arc of them at the helm. And if he's finishing this story arc, I'll be actually, you know, a little bit more leeway with, you know, my timeline. It won't just be a couple issues, you know, just to see because he's got to we got to see how he handles, how he finishes up and then how he launches his own individual ideas and his own story and see what happens with the crafts thing on that. So. I'm definitely in on this, you know, book, you know, but it is going to be interesting to see the differences and the changes because, you know, uh, Robinson is just this, you know, series from, you know, from Go was absolutely wonderful. And I'm like, ah, dang it. It's, I understand people got to move on, but why? (laughs) Please stay. Have you seen the artwork for issue 17 at all? No. Uh, Batman's back. Batman's back. Superman's back. I want to see where that's going to go. Now, which is it? Who is the Batman, though? We don't know that, do we? I No, we haven't been given that info. We don't know who this new Batman is. Info, and I can see Clark, you know, from the previous issues, that he survived. I can see, you know, understand that because you didn't really see him die. But Bruce, he blew up pretty good. Yeah, I can't understand uh, that Bruce Wayne surviving. So if there's somebody in the cape and cowl, it can't be Bruce Wayne. It has to be somebody else. And that's the million-dollar question. Who is it? But it says that uh, the new Batman of Earth 2 will join the series' main title for the first time, main story for the first time, and become a major player going forward. Batman's identity is going to be revealed. Red Tornado's role is going to come as a surprise. And what comes from beneath Arkham is, uh, wow, this is cool. New faces are coming. So nice. I don't know. I'm excited. You know, I, I was very worried about this title, but now that I've heard who the writer is, I'm and that we're keeping the art team, I'm excited. So I'm in. I, I would still go on my thing, you know, can we do anything to keep James Robinson? But yes, if we I can't, uh, I'm in for Tom Taylor. Now, do we know what where he's going, what he's doing? I, he's, I think he's done with DC, and he's going to kind of do his own creator-owned stuff. He's, I, I know he had something that was rumored for a while coming from Image, and I'll certainly pick that up because I love... James Robinson's work, so I'll follow him wherever he's going to go. There was a, um, I don't know what happened with that image title that he was doing. So I, anybody listening to this, please do not, you know, take anything I'm saying as gospel. But I know that there was something solicited from to be coming from him from Image, and I, I don't know. I I'm always that way. I've talked about it on the show many times. Whenever a writer leaves, my next step is to find what's going on with that writer next where are they going to be so I want to see more James Robinson wherever I can get it there it is going into that tunnel hi guys this is Jack Bauer again and 
I just caught up on all the Forever Evil Villains Month stuff. Boy, this is rapidly becoming one of my top crime syndicate stories ever. Now, it brought up something, though. But my favorite title that I'm reading right now is Batman 66. And I noticed that it bled into Forever Evil just a little bit because the Bumbershoot Bandit is now the mayor of Gotham City. This is fantastic. And uh, I am wondering what you guys think about bringing the Linda Carter Wonder Woman show to comic books, maybe in the same digital format as, as Batman 66, or the George Reeves Superman show. Because I personally have really liked Batman 66, Smallville, and Arrow, and maybe even the old Birds of Prey show. Is there any DC shows or movie continuity you would like to continue in the comic books that's not being continued right now? All right. Thanks a lot. Talk to you later. You know, I haven't been thinking about that, but I think that's a terrific question because when he was mentioning the Linda Carter Wonder Woman show, I would say definitely to that. Uh, The George Reeves Superman show, I would say if... For the same argument why the Batman 66 comic is working, if you do it in that tone, I would love to read a classic Superman story set in that era, you know, where it's thematic to the tone of the George Reeves show. That show, for me, still holds up to this day. I really enjoy I've got those episodes, and I still enjoy watching them. They don't feel dated to me. They feel classic and timeless in their own way. They definitely epitomize an era. They're not today's era. But I don't watch them and, and like sit there and go to myself, oh, this is really just kind of lost it. I'll use an example of another show I grew up with loving as a kid, Shazam. I've watched episodes of that recently. While I can appreciate it for the show that it was back in the day, it doesn't hold the same resonance. I get nostalgic for it, but it doesn't have that wow factor to it. It's definitely a dated 70s show. So, And it's a character that I love that was one of my favorite shows as a kid. I used to run around playing Billy Batson and Mentor and plan, pretending I drove around in a Winnebago saying Shazam. I mean, that was that kind of show. But I, you know, that doesn't hold up as well. Whereas this, the George Reeves show, I think, would make a great comic right now. I would love to read that. See, I'm more towards the Linda Carter Wonder Woman over the George Reeves uh, Superman. Really? Yeah, I think I, I, think I would rather, in, I, you know. Why just, not both? Why not? Well, they, they could do both. I'd probably pick up, I'll be honest with that, I'd probably pick up both. But if I had to pick, you know, one show to pull over it would be my ranking would be wonder woman superman because i I don't know there's just the i agree with you that the the george reeves superman was a really good superman and i enjoyed when i uh, watched it and i think in comic book formats you could do more of the superman moments you can have more of the big powers and just you know that we couldn't see because of limitations on the the tv and special effects of the time that's part of the reason why I think I have probably a stronger connection to Linda Carter Wonder Woman because it was it occurred later on. They could do a little bit more with it, and I think I probably have a I've seen I know I've seen all of the uh, Wonder Woman episodes where I probably haven't seen all of the uh, Superman episodes. So I've seen all of both, and I love both. So I wasn't really saying that the I wasn't diminishing the Linda Carter Wonder Woman, and you got two different eras there. Uh, actually, a lot of what I would say about the Superman show and it holds its ability to hold up, I would apply, especially to the first season of Wonder Woman. For some reason, that that season where it was held in Nazi Germany, for for some reason, just resonated for me more as something that was a little bit more timeless because it was an, a period Agreed. piece. I would love to see more of that show. Uh, I'm, so I would I would read that as well. I, I would. See, and I really don't want to go wishy-washy on this. The only reason why I would agree with you to a certain extent is because I would love to see more Wonder Woman in general. So I would agree with that, but I don't think that I would prefer one comic over the other. I really meant what I said. I want both. I think they're both great choices. I think when you're going to do that and you're going to pull from classic, you've got to pull from the beloved series. And also take a look at which of those would work as a comic today still, the way that the 66 book does. And there's also a danger of you don't want to oversaturate the market with that gimmick. 
you know, you don't want to all of a sudden start doing, you know, 27 titles that are all classic series like that. Because what ends up happening then is eventually, you know, people are going to, you know, those are going to take a hit. And you're going to lose what's so special about them. Uh, both of those are books, though, that I would read in an instant. And I think those are primed for the digital format, the way that those are released. They'd be great episodic books. And I, I would read both of those in an instant because I think they hold up. Is there, I guess to his original question, Jim, is there one, you, you prefer the Wonder Woman one, is there a series from DC, that, like Birds of Prey? Did you watch that when it was on? Oh, yeah, I d- and watched it and loved it. And I think I, if they were to do the comic and of the continuing the adventure, I would definitely read it. Mm-hmm. But it's not anything I said, oh, I wish they would do it. Right. Yeah, you know, I think I didn't have, you know, I thought it was a really cool story and I enjoyed it. And I think I even have the entire series. You know, um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I have the entire series, but it's not anything that I'm like, I want it. I want the continuation of it or, but it's funny because I say I I don't want it, but if they gave it to me, I would read it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I can think of that I would want to see continue. And I, I I really meant what I said. I, I'd be kind of leery of overusing that gimmick because I, I think certain things work. Um, I think you're better served, like, if 66 starts declining in sales, you might want to then bring in one of the others, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So you don't overdo it. Um, I wouldn't mind them doing something like an anthology of something in a movie serial format. Because I love the classic serials, uh, you know, the old Superman one, the Batman one, things like that. It'd be great if they could do something in that format. That might be a way to do like a George Reeves Superman, you know, do it in the movie serial format. Because uh, he had one of his that was a, a serial like that, or, you know, it was a film version, I should say. It's Superman mm-hmm. and the Mole Man. It wasn't a serial. I don't think it was a serial when it was released, but I, I can't speak to that for sure. But... You know, something like that I think would be a lot of fun, you know, where it wasn't limited to just Superman and Batman. Maybe they played around with some other characters. I would love to see a classic Captain Marvel movie serial done, you know, and those type of things. Uh, I don't know, just because I like that format. I think that would be interesting to see in a comic book. And and honestly, that fits the digital releases that they're doing. So I'd be more into that kind of thing. And, and it'd be fun if they did like a detective story that way, you know, film noir. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe maybe put characters in that format that you wouldn't expect or characters that you should expect, like the question. I'd love to read a serialized question story done in a classic movie serial format. I just think that's a character that's groomed for that. Kind of like how they do like these special miniseries where they're set to... Uh, I know um, DC did like Gotham Noir and Marvel did their own like Daredevil and Wolverine and that type of stuff set in the, in that type of style. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to see that done in a digital format, something film noir. I don't know, I just think it'd be kind of neat as myself. But I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really beyond what we mentioned. There's nothing that I can think of that I'm really hard pressed for other than if, you know, I think if there's a great creator with a good story idea, the Birds of Prey one that he threw out there, I wouldn't mind seeing that if the right creator was attached to it because uh, I, I enjoyed the TV series, but it would have to be the right creator. And I don't know how much of a draw there'd be to that. So, I don't know. Yeah. Good question. Hey, Sean and Jim. It's Jack from uh, Michigan. I just want to let you all know that I've really enjoyed Forever Evil issues one and two so far, and the fact that the crime syndicate really is more of a more modernized take of the classic uh, group from the 60s and then Reader by Morrison and what have you, and the fact that uh, Ultraman actually snorted green kryptonite like coke that was kind of funny in a dark twisted way and also really enjoyed some of the stories from uh, the hand black and white number one such as the um don't know where don't don't know how one with uh batman superman joker and uh robin dick grayson that was really kind of cool it was like like you said kind of the classic old school kind of batman and robin story with kind of superman playing a part in it as well I also really enjoyed the, uh, and surprisingly, actually, to um, the uh, Neil Adams story. That was uh, quite well done. That actually also proves how truly central to the Batman 
mythology and story that Bruce Wayne truly is. It's Dan DiDio is basically wrong. Batman isn't uh, the true identity of Bruce Wayne. It's the other way around. Bruce Wayne makes the Batman. Bruce Wayne is who he is on the inside. That's just my opinion. John Jim, I don't know if you all agree or disagree. Thanks very much for a great podcast every week. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so far. I'm kind of passionate on my belief on who Batman really is. I really believe that Batman is one mask, Bruce Wayne is another mask, and the guy that we see with Alfred is who he really is. Like, so I, I really think there's two masks there. You know, it's it's the public persona of Bruce Wayne, there is the Batman mask when he goes out there, and he only is really himself in those vulnerable moments when he's with Alfred. And we'll see that with the Batman family from time to time, where he'll be that guy too. But that third persona is the real Bruce Wayne. The one who is not hiding behind what Batman makes him. Not hiding behind Bruce Wayne, the playboy. The one who is really, and he is Bruce Wayne, so I agree with him on that end. But I really think it is a third persona that is distinctive from those other two. That's kind of my take on who he is. But what do you think? I kind of like that uh, analogy that you're throwing out there of it's not one or the other. It's there's the un, that there's that third part, that third person. Because I've always have been one of the people who said that Batman is who he is and Bruce Wayne is the disguise. But the moments where the you know, the moments you talk about where we see not Batman interacting with Alfred. We see a Bruce Wayne out reacting with Alfred. We see, like, you know, I'm thinking back to when after uh, Batman was, you know, dead and gone and he returns and we have that great moment between him and Tim. Yes. They're sitting on top of the building. First thing Bruce does is he pulls out a little device, clicks it, bam, fires an EM pulse, takes out any cameras or whatnot that could watch him. And then he drops the mask. Tim drops his mask, and the two of them have that, you know, that hug. And it was just that great, tender moment where he wasn't Batman. He wasn't Bruce Wayne. He was that father figure saying thank you to his son who never gave up on him, who never, you know, said, it, yes, he's dead. No, he kept fighting. I know in my heart he's still alive. And it was one of those great Tim stories where he never said die. He never gave up. And you see Bruce acknowledging that. And those moments always contradict my um, my opinion that Batman is the true personality. So having introducing a third person makes it, you know, kind of a, a nice explanation, you know, because he's not one, he's not the other. He is that combination. Yeah, and your example is exactly what I'm talking about. You've totally got it. That those moments are when we see the real guy, um, and and he can't show that when he's wearing the mask, and he will refuse to show that when he's wearing the mask. Occasionally, we'll get a moment with Superman, where while he's wearing the mask, he'll become the real guy, uh, but that's very rare. But that's usually reserved for a Superman when he's in that moment. And that's the, that's where we get the real key into that relationship and friendship. Mm -hmm. It's where instead of Batman and Superman, they become Clark and Bruce in costume, that moment that I really think is them. But it's not the same Bruce Wayne as the other mask. And you, you totally got it. That's amen. That's exactly how I feel. Hey, Sean and Jim, it's Anthony again. Um, I just left a voicemail that was cut to gutly, so if you could not use that one and use this one instead, um, that would be great. Um, so, I, again, I wanted to say uh, my condolences to you, Sean. I hope everything's going well, and uh, hopefully um, I can... Uh, we can, you know, everything's going well. So uh, let's talk some comics, though. Um, my last the call that I intended to have read, it was just cut abruptly, so that's why I asked you to use this one instead. Um, what I wanted to ask, talk to you guys about is the subject of those comic book stories that you think are, like, the best, you know, your favorites, that are brilliant, but no one talks about. You know, they're not really, you know, they're not like Dark Knight Rises or any, not, not Dark Knight, right, Dark Knight Returns or anything like that, but you know, stories that clicked with you and maybe not just with you, but, you know, they're not really, you know, they're the greats of all time, considered the greats of all time. So I wanted to talk about a couple stories with you real quick that 
you know, a lot of people don't talk much about. Um, one Marvel, one DC, one Marvel, and briefly one other Marvel one. Um, the first one will be um, Flash Annual Number 7, which is an Elseworlds story, and it till, and it's called the, the Barry Allen story, and basically it takes place in an alternate universe where, like the mainstream universe at the time, because this was published in 1994, Barry, Barry Allen was dead. With that said, um, they're making a film about his life, about, you know, all the moments leading up to his death. Directing is Wally West, who was also in this continuity, the Kid Flash, but he's now in a wheelchair, and for reasons unknown, and he's basically trying to get this movie made. There's all kinds of complications. He uh, He's kind of whiny in it. You know, um, he is still married to Linda in Linda Park in this continuity. She's kind of the only reason he has to live for, basically, in this story. Um, you, know, you have Captain Cold, who basically plays the role of a villain who, who plays the victim act, who basically says, oh, well, I was really victimized by the Flash. He bullied me, that type of thing. And his novel, she has a, a not, like a book in this continuity that's getting a lot of attention. Um, now, mind you, this Flash was during the second volume of Flash to Wally West, manual number seven. I don't remember who wrote it. I know they have special thanks to Mark Wade, and I know Ed Bean, who's still doing work for DC, is what drew this issue. So basically, this collides into a confrontation with both Wally West and Captain Cold. Um, you know, things come to a head. At one point, Captain Cold even takes over production of the film. Um, it's a very, very cool story, and it's very illustrates why, like, you know, the what if, the else world, those elements. And it plays with the idea of the Flash in a different way as opposed to, you know, simply... Because it plays with the with the fact that, with the superhero celebrities, which much of the Flash does, older Flash stuff does. You have the Flash Museum and things like that, and it plays with the celebrity aspect in a different way. It's a very cool story. I remember I bought it for a buck not too long ago. If you guys can find it, it's great. I don't think it's going to be printed, but it's a really cool issue. Um, the other one, um, in the last call that I made, um, that, you know, that ended abruptly, I wasn't sure the issue numbers. I looked them up. Um, talk about Captain America's 360, 367 to 370. Now, what this story this story is is very very cool. Um, cool. Basically, it takes place during Acts of Vengeance, which was a storyline in 1990, I believe it was, a crossover in the Marvel Universe where Loki gathered the major villains of the Marvel Universe to conduct some sort of plan against what was it? Against the Marvel superheroes. Of course, there was conflicts in this group. One of the most notable conflicts was. Magneto and Red Skull. Magneto being a Holocaust victim, Red Skull essentially a Nazi. In this issue, you know, in in an earlier issue, the Red Skull is kind of plotting against the other villains, but Magneto basically gets the upper hand, defeats the Red Skull, and locks him in a bunker with nothing but water. It plays into both history, you know, Holocaust victim, Nazi victim. Um, throughout the following issues, Crossbones and the rest of the, you know, uh, henchmen called the Skeleton Crew at the time, of the Red Skull, they're looking for him. They run into the Hellfire Club. Uh, Captain America faces a robotic version of Magneto. It's all crazy until Captain America frees him, saves him, and he has the ultimate choice of leaving him there or not. And Captain America, you know, it's kind of a moral battle for Cap at the end, whether he should save his foe or not. And a lot of it plays with the Red Skull's fears because when we see the Red Skull, he's hallucinating, you know, and maybe even considering some of the mistakes he makes, but he doesn't. You know, it's it's a really cool issue, really developed a, a villain that's very hateful and malevolent in, in a human way that we don't sympathize, but we know where he's coming from, but we don't sympathize, if that makes sense. It's really a great issue. I really, I really loved it. Um, lastly, talk briefly about a story called, uh, it's from Uncanny X-Men Annual Man. Uh, annual 17. It's from the 90s. Yeah, I know that, that evil period, but whatever. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that came from the 90s. There's a lot of bad stuff, too. In this story, we find out that Mastermind's dying, and he traps a bunch of X-Men inside his mind, especially, particularly Jean Grey. And it's basically Jean Grey and him coming to terms with their sort of relationship. If you remember, Mastermind's the one that turned Jean Grey into 
was responsible for the Dark Phoenix storyline, that legendary story. So it's kind of her coming together. I believe Scott LaBelle wrote that story, who's obviously writing Teen Titans and stuff. And I never got the vibe why a lot of people dislike LaBelle, because I always thought that story was amazing. Well, that can be very good, I will say. He, you know, he he's a very good writer at times, um, and that's one of his best stories, I think. And that's one of my personal favorites. So there's that. Do you guys have any from the Marvel DC side, you know, that like, you know, no one talks about, you know, it's not little known. It's not even being reprinted, maybe, to go to that extent. So I um, want to say great podcast. Love the Forever Evil. Maybe next time we'll talk more about modern comics. But right now I want to talk a couple about a couple of those great stories. And uh, let me know what you think, if you read them, or what are a couple of yours that, you know, maybe not a lot of people know about and they don't talk about. Thanks. Bye. I could go on for hours about this topic. Um, <laughs> it's it's really one of those things. And I know what I was doing is as he was sharing his voicemail, I just started randomly writing down books that came to mind that are favorites of mine. And this is in no way a comprehensive list. But um, on the Batman end, I, we did it on the show, The Cult. Um, whereas I think it's been reprinted recently and people are more aware of the storyline, I don't think it's ever spoken of in the same tone as things like Killing Joke and Dark Knight Returns, and I think it should be. I think it's just that caliber of a story. There's a Spider-Man graphic novel that I just love. It's The Amazing Spider-Man Spirits of the Earth by Charles Vess. It's a wonderful story that took place in Scotland. It's gorgeous. It's ha- it's painted by Vess, and it was one of those stories that just really struck me as a hardcover graphic novel that just was mind-blowingly cool to me, just because of the visual styling and the story and the links that Vess went to to create that world. Star Child by James A. Owen is uh, an independent book that uh, a lot of people missed that I think is just amazing. They just did a Kickstarter for it recently that um, Owen's going to put you know extra material in that he kind of wanted to uh, share to longtime fans for it, and I was really excited about that. Moonshadow, J.M.D. Mateus, John J. Muth. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful story. It's had periods of like immense popularity, but I, th- I think it's something that maybe people listening might have missed, and I think it's really cool. M., by John J. Muth. It was based on the Fritz Lang work, and uh, it was hand-painted by Muth. Some of the most breathtaking artwork I've ever seen. Seekers into the Mystery by J.M.D. Mateus. It was a short-lived Vertigo series that I, I adored. This one might, I don't know, this might be questionable, but Hitman by Garth Ennis. I think it's overshadowed by Preacher, and it's Garth Ennis and John McCrea. Really terrific kick-butt series. Have you ever read Hitman, Jim? Yeah, I think I have. Hitman's amazing. And I remember when that was coming out in monthly single issues. I could not wait to read that book. Um, it pretty much, though, is, is action perfection. Uh, the, the, the characters were just it was straight out of an action film. And they were really likable characters. And I, just, I found myself just loving the whole cast. Thieves and Kings by Mark Oakley is a series that I, it's, it's still being wrapped up. It's gone to graphic novels and how it's delivery, but I know he's looking to finish it soon, and it's been one of those uh, great loves of mine. He was mentioning before Mark Grunwald, and I'm going to throw out um, S- Squadron Supreme. I know that that led to the Supreme Power series, but I still don't think that Squadron Supreme, the 12-issue miniseries, as it was, gets enough love for how cool that series was. I remember at the time when that came out, just being blown away. It was That miniseries was my first exposure to those characters, and it was growing up loving DC's multiverse. It was a chance to read an alternate Earth in the Marvel side of things. And I really dug the whole year of enjoying that book. It just felt like really epic. And it was like it was kind of like Marvel's Justice League. And it just felt like big and powerful and majestic like that. And it dealt with mature themes. So it was something that really stood out to me. I'm going to throw out an uh, Uncanny X-Men issue. Because, you know, a lot of times when you hear about the X-Men storylines, it's the crossovers that people remember. You know, things like the Dark Phoenix Saga and, you know, any of the crossovers over the years that have had major mutant massacre, things like that, that have had major impact are things that stand out in people's mind. But my first issue reading the X-Men, and I've got a soft spot for it, is Uncanny X-Men 160. 
And it was in August of 1982. Chris Claremont, Brent Anderson, Bob Wyacek. Um, it, it was just, it was a gorgeous issue. This was the Belasco issue where I- Ileana was pulled into limbo. She came in, as, went in as a little kid. She was pulled back out at the end of the issue and had lost years of her life. She had been trapped in Belasco's world. Her, they let go of her hands, and when they re-grabbed her hands, time had passed. And in that world, when they were in limbo, each member of the X-Men encountered like a dead version of themselves. You know, so I mean, there was there was like alternate. It was an alternate version of the X Men where Belasco had won and defeated them. There was even an older version of Storm there. So it was a terrific storyline that I just really enjoyed. And it was my first issue of Uncanny X Men. It was a done in one, and it just felt big. It felt epic. I can reread that issue over and over and over again and never tire of it. It still holds up to this day. And I don't know, just really enjoyed that. So it was it was a good issue for me. Secret Six, of course, you know, we've mentioned that on the show many times. Captain Adam most recently. I thought that that series did not get enough love. Um, top Ten. I And the reason why I mention that, yeah, it's an Alan Moore series, and um, Gene Ha and Art Lyon were a part of it uh, with the amazing artwork. But, you know, when you hear Alan Moore, a lot of times people go to things like Watchmen and V for Vendetta and stuff like that. You don't hear enough love for the America's Best Comics line, particularly Top Ten. I really, really love that series to the point where, you know, you buy an absolute edition of a series because you love it that much. And that's one of those. And I, I'd be remiss. On the show, I, I some it's we sometimes cartoon it up a little bit with my love for Hawkman. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Hawkman run, in particular by Justin Gray and Jimmy Palmiotti. Those writers, when they took over Hawkman with the artwork by Joe Bennett, just blew me away. And I was already reading the series under Jeff Johns, and when James Robinson and Jeff Johns started it, it was a terrific series. This isn't taking anything away from them. There was something that clicked for me when this creative team took over, and they really made me understand Hawkman in a way that I hadn't previously made me really love the character. This idea of this guy who kept reincarnating over and over again to and connected with his lost love at some point in time in that life. And the two of them were doomed to continue this kind of path, but ultimately would meet up again and fall in love again. There was something about that. I, you know, um, the sap in me loves this big, powerful. I mean, because it was kick butt. You know, big Hawkman with his, you know, kick butt mace and you know, all the stuff that he does. But yet he was this archaeologist, you know, and he he had this like Indiana Jones side to him that was really cool. He was like an interesting amalgam of a whole bunch of different really cool concepts that made him unique because of that. And I really enjoyed that. And it went back to his roots. And it's something that I think is really an important part of the character. The idea that Kendra may or may not have been, and that was constantly the the, the, the crux of the series, is she Shaira? Was she not Shaira? Yet she was falling in love with him, but was he only in love with her because he thought she was Shaira? That type of thing, all the way through it, I thought was a really neat twist because Kendra in and of herself was such a well-developed character in JSA that I couldn't help but love the series. So it's series like that that I think, you know, you don't hear a lot of people talk about that Hawkman run as being one that kind of stands out. For me, it did, and I can't recommend it highly enough as being just a really superb run of a series. Jim, do you have runs of a book or something that stands out for you that you're kind of like, people don't notice this enough, but I sure did? Um. Well, uh, Green Lantern Mosaic was mm. one that I've never really heard anybody talk about, but I absolutely loved because that was my introduction to really to John Stewart. I wasn't a heavy DC reader at the time. This came out when I was in college, and I was still reading more Marvel. And I slowly, because my my buddy uh, Joe was a DC guy, and he was you know I was reading, I was borrowing some of his stuff, and. Yeah, I don't. I don't even remember why I picked up Mosaic. I think I. Ex- I think I grabbed it by accident. You know, I think I was go- reaching for Green Lantern, but I grabbed it by accident and I read it. I was like, and it was the issue where John first puts up the the walls 
you know, dividing the different mosaic is basically a bunch of people from various planets were put together on a single planet and john stewart was pretty much kind of like the sheriff of them but he initially crafts all these walls the the green energy to separate all the different people because they weren't getting along they were fighting they were feuding those all types of problems so finally he's like forget this you know you guys can't live together so i'm going to have you live separate and it was a cool moment that i just remember just you know the inner dialogue where he's talking cuz you know he's you know he had the ring on just his bare hand he said i need to feel the ring on my flesh you know and he's just focusing and concentrating and he across this planet wide you know this this planet he constructs these giant walls i was like oh this guy's cool and i remember thinking john stewart was a cool guy and i started getting more books and that you know really is a my my intro and one of the reasons i always thought john stewart was a cool guy because of you see his just how his mind and just how intellectual and how strong it is and it's just i was like okay this is a good green lantern this is a guy that yeah i want to follow um I think the Wolverine uh, Kitty Pride series has never had enough love. Oh, amen. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And, you know, I, the moments like um, when, you know, when she, you know, when, you know, Logan leaves Kitty to this rock garden type of Zen, you know, you know, sand pit or whatever, whatever the meditation is. And it's an absolutely perfect layout. Yes. A beautiful mixture of, <laughs> You know, the rocks and the sand and this and that. And, you know, and Kitty's like, yeah, you know, did it perfect. It's, you know, and then she realizes, I shouldn't be able to do this. Why? How can I do this? This, what's going, this is not what, uh, you know, a kid should be able to do. And she realizes that there's something not right. There's something, someone else, you know, something else inside her. And I thought that was just a really cool, just realization on her part. And it was a great play by Logan because he's like, get her to do it. And then get her to realize it herself. I thought that was just a cool, a cool part of the story. Um, I, I really liked that side of Logan. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I just, you're, you're throwing out something that's a series that I really loved. I'm so glad you threw it out there. Because I agree with you, that's not one you hear a lot of people throw out. And um, it was really great to see, you see the tough Logan side in that, you know, the typical Logan kick butt that we normally like. But then you also see the soft spot that he had for Kitty. That led to, I think, the same kind of Logan that we see with characters like Jubilee later Mm -hmm. on. Um, And it's very much in character for Logan to have that softer side when he can mentor somebody. And that's the disciplined warrior that we often see with him, where there is a caring to him. And I don't know, I just, I really enjoyed that series as well. That made me see Wolverine in a different light, and it was really well done. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just the phase, pride. <laughs> yeah. You get some cool Wolvie moments. You get some cool personal moments. That, yeah, that, I, that was one of the series that I absolutely loved. Um uh, let me think here. What else do we got going on? Eh, we said a bunch of different stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This is a toughie because a lot of my stuff is newer. You know, I don't. Ha- you know, I do have long term reading, but when I was a kid, I was really. I was. I don't think I appreciated what the some of the stories I was getting, and it's not until later on in life that I actually was able to appreciate the true the stories being told and everything that happened like um you think about the uh I can't think of the number off the top of my head, but uh robin the the suicide episode issue they did it was that one shot issue where you know, you know where Tim comes across a kid who's gonna jump. And I, you know, when we talked about it on the show, how much I loved just the way they crafted it. It was beautiful Freddie art. We had some great story being told. We had this this absolute perfect way to handle a jumper, perfect way to handle suicide. And it was, you know, reading it, you're like, okay, this is exact. This is by the numbers. This is how I would want to see the hero deal with this. And you know, it was one of those moments that touched me, and just like um, identity crisis. And granted, everyone people have talked about it, and but for me, it wasn't just the overall story of identity crisis. It was that scene, you know, the uh, Tim's uh, dad, his death scene when he's on the phone and talking to Tim, and he's like, 
yeah, I'm proud of you. You're doing a great job. I love you. You know, and just that whole that those father moments where he wanted to make sure his son knew you didn't fail me. If I die right now, you didn't fail. You are doing a great thing here. You're a hero. You're doing and it was just and you know, it's funny, I'm talking about it now and I'm feeling myself get emotional and choked up. And how long ago has it been since I last read this series? It's that that is the you know, as much as people do talk about identity crisis, I don't think I think it should be talked about even more just because it you know, when um when my niece Cassie read it, she sent me a text and I think it's probably the perfect description of identity crisis and I told her this is to me the perfect description of it. She said, I was punched in the heart. And I think that was just a oh my god, just yes. You know, cuz this was just an amazing, just absolutely wonderful story that I still get choked up and I still get emotional when I think about it and when I read it. And also another series that I still get choked up and I still get emotional over it, um, We 3. You know, that's another one that, you know, it's these animals who they've been given enhancements and they've been given augmentation and they're just, you know, they just want to do their job. They just want it, but the government can't allow these intelligent creatures, these intelligent animals who have, you know, been hardwired and they know there would be public outcry. So they send in a kill squad to take out these animals and these animals are just they just want to serve. They're like, good boy, good boy, just I'm a good boy. You know, the dog is just so blindly loyal. And, you know, they're out there, you know, they're out to just, you know, to kill these innocent animals. And it just, again, another one that when I start thinking about it, I start getting choked up over it. You know, there's, you know, you get true emotional reactions from some of this stuff. You know, one story that I want to shout out that um, I don't hear about as much now, Spider-Man, it was called Craven's Last Hunt. This was from, uh, in 1987, it was published across all the Spider-Man titles. And it was J.M. DeMatteis and Mike Zeck. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of J.M. DeMatteis' writing. So, I mean, there's a reason why his name popped up multiple times throughout this. And this was one where a Craven uh, hunted down Spider-Man, buried him alive, and Spider-Man digs his way out of the grave. Like, weeks later, Craven, during the time that Spider-Man's buried alive... Um, and this was where Spider-Man had the symbiote, so he was able to kind of live because of that. But after, um, while Chris Spider-Man's underground, Craven takes over his identity and goes after the villain Vermin, whom Spidey needed help to beat originally. So Spidey digs his way back out and kind of reclaims his role. And I, I don't want to say too much other than that, because there's, there's more to the story and where it goes. But... It was just one of those stories that the artwork is gorgeous. It's collected, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's it's a really, really terrific Spider-Man story. It was collected as a premier hardcover for Marvel, which I have, and it's just it's a gorgeous. It was uh, it's Web of Spider-Man 31 to 32, Amazing Spider-Man 293 and 294, and Spectacular Spider-Man 131 and 132. It was just a really big story with Craven the Hunter. And I remember as a kid thinking of Craven was a little bit more cartoony. This made him a real genuine hunter in this story and made me see him in a way that maybe I, I should have always seen him as a character. And he probably was depicted in other stories, but that was one for me that just made me go, whoa. And it was just a really terrific story. I don't know, like I, like I said earlier, I could go on and on, but um, there's so many great comic stories that I feel throughout history haven't had the chance to get or maybe don't get as much notice today as they did at different times that might be a better way to put it um there's stories that have had various levels of popularity and let me just throw out um i probably should have said this before we three it's uh, written by grant morrison mm -hmm. with art by uh, frank quitely and it's absolutely just amazing amazing story it's a vertigo it's published vertigo i know there's multiple trade paperbacks and various releases out there it's the highest count, highest praise and recommendation from me and the robin issue i am i uh, mentioned it's uh 156 it's called the high dive uh written by beach and, and it's of course art by uh freddie williams so it's those are two issues that we talked about the robin we talked about the robin issue before on the show and i'm not sure which episode but it's again i it's a one it's a one-off and i absolutely love it and i still to this day you know will 
I periodically will read it, and I will just you know just marvel at it. And same thing, we three. I I every time I read it, I I still get emotional and I still get choked up over it. So those are two highly recommendations from me. Did you get the deluxe hardcover? Yes. Oh yes, yeah, I with did. The forty pages of bonus material. Oh god, yeah. Yeah, and that's still available. So I mean, that's if you haven't got that one, that's really the way to grab the book. If you yes. haven't read it, because uh, I love those extras. I mean, that was really a terrific, well put together series. That was really a good question. Uh, this is Jack Bauer again, and I'm sorry for calling the second time on the same episode. But Sean brought up the reluctant leader debate that's kind of been going on this show for years, and uh, that was hilarious. And I was just too slow to pick it up. Um, but anyway, the fact is, I want to actually throw my hat in the ring and agree with Jim on Superman's reluctant leader concept, at least what Jim was arguing way back when. I think that what he really means, I don't know if the word reluctant is actually what he meant, but what he really meant is that guys like Hawkman, Batman, you know, when they, they don't care whether, in most cases, they don't care whether or not you know why they're doing something. They know they're right. And unless you're like Robin or Hot Girl or someone really close to them, they expect you to do it when they tell you to do it. Clark, in my mind, is always trying to get the person to follow him by his example, and he wants them to understand what it is. When he tells them to do something, he wants them to understand why to do it. It's more of a father figure leader thing than kind of a military leader. So I think that's what Jim meant. And if that is, then I agree with it. And, uh, I, well, anyway, that's about it. So, um, I will, uh, when you guys bring up the Shadow of the Hawkman, I'll throw my hat into that ring too. Until then, tweet, tweet, and, uh, talk to you later. We actually came to a similar conclusion, though. Yeah. That it wasn't an issue of, we were both going off of a different definition of a leader. You were talking about a military leader. And if you actually look up the definition of a leader, it actually has more than one meaning. If if you look at somebody in charge of others, where his his Batman and Hawkman references, I I think are spot on to what how you were viewing your concept of leader. But I was more viewing a leader as someone people follow. Um, You know, a mentor, a guru. And when you take a look at Superman, Superman leads by example. He is one of those people that, like, if you're going into a battle, if I'm going to follow somebody in a battle, I'm going to follow Superman. Superman isn't reluctant to be the kind of guy that he is, to live the kind of life that he does. And that's a definition of a leader. A leader is somebody who doesn't follow somebody else. They lead by example, by what they do. They do their own thing, and other people naturally follow them. Now, if you go off the military definition of a leader, I do actually agree with Jim that Superman's reluctant to be a military leader. He is not a military leader. (laughs) He does not see himself as being in charge of a head of a nation, political party, a military unit. He doesn't see himself as being that kind of guy. Whereas I agree with the examples of like a Hawkman or a Batman leading that type of a squad and, and having no issue with being that kind of a leader. I don't see that being a problem for them. So I actually agree with the examples that he's mentioning as... Superman would be reluctant to be that kind of a leader. I just don't think he's reluctant to be the kind of a leader that people would naturally follow. Uh, he's, he's that type of a leader by definition. He does not follow somebody else's example. He is the example. So yeah, I, I, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting debate, and it all depends on how you see the word leader. Exactly, exactly. And first off, before I make any other comments, I have to say that if... You agree with me? You can call into the show as many times as you want. Call in three, four times in a single episode. It does not matter to me. As long as you're agreeing with me, I'm okay with that. So and, don't worry about and, calling in twice. <laughs> and if you call into the show and you agree with Jim, and you also feel that you would get confused by Bruce Wayne being on Arrow, you may also call into the show and verify that as well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, I'll tell you something. <laughs> In all seriousness, we've had the the reluctant leader, and now we throw it out there as a joke and a comment. But I love the phrase "fatherly leader." I like that too. Yeah, I re I gotta tell you, you know what? That gets a 
from you know from the old sensei here. That's an outstanding statement and a great way to describe uh, Superman as a leader, mm-hmm. you know, a fatherly leader. I like that. You know, I think um, I there's probably going to be times when I refer to him as showing the fatherly leadership style of uh, Superman as opposed to you know my reluctant leader comments because that was an absolutely wonderful way to describe. Superman's leadership style and why again why I said reluctant leader it's you know we've had this this debate multiple times that it is a military versus non-military versus fatherly appearance of the leadership style that you know which you know would make for reluctancy and or appearance of and or just it that, that the a fatherly leadership style you don't have that military strike force. You don't have the, you here, you here, you here, you here, do this, hit. That's Batman. That's, you know, Hawkman. That's probably, you know what, um, in a way I would say maybe Hal Jordan, because but Hal does have that comical style to him, but we're seeing in the current Green Lantern that he know. is able to say, throw no, mans. I, Hal Jordan's a good example, I think, that you're throwing out there. When it's time to step up in battle, Hal's not reluctant yeah. to lead the Green Lantern Corps into a charge. Yeah, he throws out there. He he tries. He's not. You know, it's yeah, especially recently we're seeing him really step up in a military leadership style where he is throwing out the commands. You know, but he, you know and. So he is a good example. He's not a reluctant leader. He also has that military style, but he's not as hard edge. He's not a hard edge military. He's more of the, you know, the softer, cooler, you know, military, you know, the... Do you have to be? No, because even within, you know, um, even within a military structure, you have different leadership styles. Right. You, know, you have the Patton style, you know, where you're, you know... It's, you know, less, you know, less about niceties, more about doing what he says right now. You know, you have the uh, there's fear, intimidation style. There's complimentary style. There's the the buddy buddy style. There's various within that confines. But within that confines, there is the fact that leader says it, you do it. And it's that strong, very defined leadership role where I am in charge. This is my command. Even within all the different nuances, whether you're leading by fear, leading by friendship, leading by complimentary, all the different you know leadership styles, there still is that definitive chain of command, that definitive structure. And Superman does not fit into that definitive structure. But if you look at the definition of a leader, right. from somebody whom people follow because they... I mean, Superman does not, by any stretch, follow other people. They follow him. But he would follow Batman if, uh, you know, or actually even another hero who had the plan. You know, think about, like, um, if... Uh, Ooh, I see, I disagree with you on that. Uh, you got to go read JLA. Batman, yes, was the strategic tactician, I get that. But where the guys would butt heads many, many times was over a difference of ways that they operate. And Superman is not afraid to step up in any point in time and question the way that somebody else operates because he's got a certain code and he stands by that code as a leader, not a military leader, but as a right. leader, um, super, the way Metropolis runs, nobody else runs their city the way Superman does. He's a, he's a leader. He's a true leader in that sense. So I completely disagree. This is where the debate totally began. I know. This is where it And, and yeah. I feel it already – it's getting ready to go yeah. into it again. Yeah. <laughs> because you're, you're, you're limiting the concept of leader to a military definition, and it, that's not the only way that a leader is defined. And I admit that's not – I've, I've since admitted that's not the only way. I'm talking within that confines – Within that definition, that's but my... But I don't know why you're arguing that, something. because I agree that he's not a military right, leader. Right, exactly. You're the one who keeps arguing with me. <laughs> no, you're the one that keeps trying to somehow validate the fact that he's not a leader. And I, I that part... That that, but it validate. isn't true. That's your limited definition of a leader. <laughs> have a very limited definition of a leader. <laughs> 
I agree with you that you're a hundred percent correct that he's not a military leader. But if you want to say he's a reluctant military leader, I will never have an issue with you. <laughs> you want to say he's a reluctant leader, I completely disagree. And that's what I'm saying. He's a reluctant military leader. But that wasn't what you were saying. Well, now I'm saying it that okay. way. Okay. If you say it that way, I 100% agree with you. Right. Exactly. See, in my head, when I was saying reluctant leader, I was saying reluctant military leader. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In your head, you were also saying that Bruce Wayne being on Arrow is confusing in that same moment. <laughs> Hold on. I'm not saying I would be confused. I'm saying the powers that be who have uh-huh. no idea... Mm-hmm. Anything about the people who are actually watching their show, Uh they think we would be confused. It's like a lot of times with, you know, with some. So they're a reluctant programmer. (laughs) 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 You know, there are times when I'm trying to get ready to throw out a really good argument and a really good comment. And you throw out something like that and like, what the hell? What was wrong? I'm with that? tapping out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good call. It's actually I like I agree with you. I liked his fatherly leader comment yeah. because he actually does make the distinction. There's more than one kind of leader. Actually, it's one of the things that I like about the DC heroes in general is that they really if you take a look at so many of them and you were pulling out characters like Hawkman and Batman, I would make a strong argument that each of them in their own way is a very different sort of leader in the way that they'd handle things. And that's one of the things I like about DC's characters. Wonder Woman, a powerful argument could be made for Wonder Woman in a way that she presents herself as very, she'd be a very different sort of leader than either of those two. And that's because these characters are so well defined. Aquaman, how would you rank him on the leadership end? Especially after having read his series right now. Ooh, that's a toughie. Because... See, I think, I, I think would... he's the reluctant leader of the DC Universe. I, I think at all levels, he's a reluctant leader. I think he's a terrific hero. Yeah. See, but I think he's an, a reluctant leader. Well, you figure he walked away from the role. Mm-hmm. And he, he's walked away from the role multiple loca- multiple times. So he does it, but with with him, it's not about a leader. It's about a reluctant nobility. He doesn't want to be king. He doesn't want that role. He doesn't want you know. I don't know if it's that responsibility, but it's more of he doesn't. That's not how he sees himself. He doesn't want the uh, you know. So when you say reluctant leader, I also say reluctant nobility. Mm-hmm. You know, he does. That's where his whole thing comes from. It's not about reluctant leader, you know, per se. Is it's about, you know, reluctant nobility, reluctant title. He doesn't want that role, you know, for himself. Now, if you th- you think about when the Atlanteans attacked, you know, and they attacked Boston, they attacked Gotham. He had a very strong, you know, role in the, the defense in the fighting because he knew what was coming. So right there, you see him not as a reluctant leader, you know, because he, you know, assumed command of the situation because he knew what was coming. So that right there says he's not reluctant leader. He's reluctant yeah. nobility. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see that argument. It's uh, it's he's a very the DC characters are very, very interesting when it comes to uh, talking about just the way that they present themselves, their role in the world. I don't know, it, it, that's fun. You won't get away from me this time, Buster. Once again, sponsoring this episode is DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. Remember, this is your chance to get those Villains Month books, all 52 and the For Evil number 1 3D Motion Variant Cover Edition, $199 regularly, 50% off, only $99.99. Over at InStockTrades.com, remember to check out the amazing sales they're offering with 45% off DC Comics trades and hardcovers and 50% off DC Archives editions. But they also have those amazing specials like I was mentioning, like Batman City of Owls, Volume 2. That's 50% off, only $8.49. I mean, those deals are absolutely stellar. So I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. 
want to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1-440-388-4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. We love having you a part of our show. Remind everyone about RagingBullets.com. That is every week I post what's going on with the show episodes. So if you want to see news on what's going on with the show, RagingBullets.com is your source. We are on Twitter. And that's actually our show website's linked right to our Twitter page. We also have a Facebook group that's separate from our Facebook page. The Facebook group is a wonderful community of podcasters, comic creators, friends of the show, bloggers, anybody that wants to join into the community and have comic discussion. Don't feel that it's limited to DC Comics only. We're all fans of geek culture, so please join into the group and join into the amazing discussion. I just want to thank the community for just continuing to make that just an awesome place to stop by and see what's going on. We're also on Google+. Plus. So you can pretty much so find us everywhere, and we love just the community aspects of the show. Our next episode, Jim, we're going to be talking more comics. There's a lot of stuff coming out lately that you and I have both been talking about that we want to talk on the show. So we'll be talking over the next week or so, and uh, just be. we also have a couple other opportunities that I want to try and work out as well that I'm being deliberately vague about because um, we've, we've discussed them. So uh, we will be seeing everyone next week. Bye. Flying through space and time, a thousand different lifetimes. Faded for love and loss, and incredibly clear sidelines. Swinging your mace around, such a practical loud look. Helping the JSA and occasionally supporting your own book. Hawk man, Hawk man. Eagle eyes can't see, Hawk man, your plan. And what you do to me, Hawk man. The villains are closing in, be they then in guard or Egyptian. Working so hard to thwart you and Hawk girl's mission. Are not on your side, and danger seems to stack up. Things would be so much easier if you would just call for backup. Hawk man, Hawk man, eagle eyes can't see your plan.